Hello everyone and welcome. We're here at Brainstorm Inland and today we're joined by Vance Kovacs and Justin Sweet for a special live stream of their Kickstarter book Eclipse, The Well in the Black Sea. Today we'll learn a bit about the artists and their book, ask them questions, and watch both Vance and Justin do a live demo. Make sure to check out brainstorminland.com for all the courses we have available for this upcoming fall term. Vance will be co-teaching a five-week course with Marshall Vandruff called Lessons from the Masters focusing on comparative anatomy. Without further ado, here's Vance and Justin. Thank you. Well, this is a um, uh, this is a long-awaited evening that we owed our uh, Kickstarter backers, James. <laughs> <clears throat> I know you emailed me, emailed me about this quite a few times. Um, part of our uh, Kickstarter that we did three years ago, three? Four. I don't know what year it was. Probably more. Five. Five. <laughs> was it 2016? It was like 2014. Was it? 14. <laughs> I got the wrong date. Did you just mumble that part? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, there was a art students package that was, they got the book and then a live stream. And this is that live stream. So, um, but part of the evening was just to open it up to anybody to, uh, to pick our brains about our careers, our art. Uh, but we'll, I guess, first talk about the, the project, the book, which we have here tonight. Uh, if you don't have a copy, you can get a chance to get a copy. If you want to just go on Amazon and grab a copy, they're up there too. Um, but we'll talk about it a little bit. I'll let Justin introduce himself. Yeah, I'm Justin. Uh, Vince and I started this project, um, it's been going on I think for 20 years, something like that. We both started working in video games at Interplay, um, I have no idea how long ago that was, 20 years ago or something like that. Yeah. But while we were working on other people's projects, we always had our own projects in mind and I think it's pretty common for people who uh, are in this industry to have their own personal projects that they want to do as an artist. And so him and I would go out to lunch a lot, and uh, we've known each other. I've known him since he was 15, uh, I was 20. So we've, we've, our history goes back quite a ways, and we share a lot of stuff in common. So I think we had a lot of the same interests regarding what we wanted to say with our art and what we wanted to do with it. Um, and so just over many lunches and just hanging out, whether it's going backpacking or having lunch together or um, playing video games, whatever, we were always bantering back and forth about this project. And it sort of took form into, uh, the title was Eclipse. And we knew there were certain elements to it and we would, do, we would do little sketches and watercolors and that's why a lot of this book, you'll see that there's just, there's line drawings, there's watercolors, there's oil paintings, there's digital paintings. But it was sort of just a thing where um, we didn't know exactly what it was, but we would, we would occasionally get hit with an idea. Um, I remember once I was in Santa Barbara with my wife on a little vacation and I had an idea and I called them and, and we, would, we would just, you know, feverishly talk about our inspiration and whatever and, and him and I were usually on the same page with stuff so it was interesting how it kind of came about but it was just, uh, um, it just kind of came together like that in these little clusters and this organic process over many years. And finally, we were, we, when Kickstarter came around, we said, let's, let's put out a book and let's see if we can get funded to actually put all these, all these ramblings that we've done over the years, whether it's with our words or our drawings or whatever, and see if we can make, you know, put that book out, which was more of an exploration than a finished book. So it was more like to document the, the, the search for what we were after, um, and I think we always kind of we always kind of uh, compared it to like a, a like a Bob Dylan album or something where the songs are a bit more metaphor and abstract, and you don't know exactly what is being said sometimes, but you feel what's being said, and so I think a lot of the stuff that we would do kind of we wanted this thing to kind of come together in a fashion where it left you with an impression, an atmosphere of what we were after. 
without literally uh, hitting you over the head with it, because I think even in our minds, I think we took joy in the fact that it wasn't completely resolved and it wasn't uh, a finished, uh, definitive thing. It was um, something that still breathed and, and had space in our minds to come up with new ideas or how to tack on more things to that. So that's, I think, in a nutshell, I mean, somewhat of what yeah. I was speaking for myself. But So that's what this book is. It's, uh, we're proud of it. I mean, I don't, I don't think we would do a Kickstarter again, but, <laughs> but you know, I mean, it's, uh, it was great to actually get something out that's your own personal stuff. Because both of us have been in this business for a long time, working in the film business as illustrators or video games, and everything we do is for other people. So this was our one, our first chance really to kind of put together all our stuff. Now, a lot of it is unfinished and and so forth, like I mentioned, but we kind of liked it that way, so. Yeah, I think I always looked at it as an opportunity to revisit it. We never we never closed the book on it, v visually even. We left it, we purposefully left room to go back into this world and develop it. And, you know, once you bring something to total resolve, that's it, you know, when the film comes out and it's on the screen, it's kind of like, all right, that was the, five years of your life or whatever there, there it is so this kind of left us uh, an opportunity to revisit go back in maybe not completely settle everything so yeah there, I think we left a lot out as far as what we've discussed there was huge parts that we had discussed as far as story and things that we I think purposely left out because those were kind of points of resolution and we didn't want to resolve it yet so uh, yeah Partially, the book was a pitch for an idea, right? A pitch for a project. Is, is this something that looks compelling enough to get funding? Or um, and we pursued a little bit, but not. I don't think anything with great energy uh, as far as trying to pursue this into a project. Uh, but I think it's something we certainly would want to do. So. Yeah. And that being said, I, I think both of us are. Uh, I think. I mean, we, we considered things like, gosh, could we make a movie out of this? Could we make a video game out of this? Could, it, could we do more books from this? Um, but even as a standalone, I think both of us felt like it's its, its own art in itself. It's its own uh, finish, just as it is, as a book. It'd be nice to take it further, but that would be a separate thing, you know, that the book would influence, certainly, but... Um, for me, speaking for myself, I mean, it, it was definitely, um, I think I'm proud of the book and I'm proud of uh, just as an end, end to itself, I feel like it accomplished what I was after. Likewise, <laughs> speaking for myself, <clears throat> yeah, I, I, uh, I'm proud of this book. I think it stands on its own. It's its own little entity, which is, which is nice, uh, having it whether we, I think that was it, like we were rolling the dice to, listen, this may not ever be some epic project on big screens or some AAA video game title, but let's get something out. And the one thing we could do is draw pictures and we could put a book together. We both love art books and thought it'd be cool to put together an art book and get an actual printed physical uh, thing, you know, that you could hold. So, so yeah, there you have it. Yeah. I don't know if there's anybody on, do we have people actually on the live stream? We do, yeah. We do. There's no questions coming in currently. If there are people who are uh, Kickstarter art package backers, then I think I wrote out a little note. They can put a little KS at the beginning of their questions if they had anything. So, but again, we weren't just going to focus on the book tonight. That was definitely a a part of why we got together, but we're going to open it up to uh, any sort of talk. And you guys that are students out there, or struggling professionals, struggling artists, <laughs> need to, need some advice, need some encouragement. Uh, we're we'll be as open of a book as we can uh, with what we can talk about with our projects. But yeah, we've both been working again for about 
maybe 20 years professionally, started in video games. Justin uh, quit Airplay to go freelance, started doing book covers, painting book covers. I stayed, I think, another maybe a year or two before the whole, the whole ship went down. <laughs> I think I got off it right at the last moment. It was still going down. I think JD stayed a little longer until <laughs> the whole thing went belly up. But uh, I was there for close to eight years. Uh, and we shared an office together uh, for three and a half years of that time. Uh, during that time, we were developing this game called Stonekeep 2, which you can look it up on YouTube, Stonekeep. It's a pretty amazing, <laughs> pretty amazing title. <clears throat> it's, uh, it was done all with that full motion video stuff and it was this real crude dungeon crawl PC game at the time and uh, we were uh, we were doing the sequel to that and it was this big project internally at an interplay and just never never got off the ground so uh, but I think it sort of cut our teeth on developing a world you know I think we were pitching doing this like okay there's stone keep 2,000 years later, here's what I like. We, we completely wiped out whatever was there before, a couple of touchstones, just so we could have the opportunity to design a whole new world. We had this whole fantasy uh, world that we were starting to develop, which was awesome. Um, a lot of fun. So, but yeah, during that time, there was a lot of Quake, a lot of playing Quake and drawing pictures. So, uh, and then dreaming this stuff up on our whiteboard and but it's good times. Yeah, we always liked world building. We always liked the idea of creating a place that you'd want to play and you'd want to hang out in. I think just like playing first person shooters way back then, like we always tended to like the games that had a lot of atmosphere. Quake, I mean, limited atmosphere. But I think we would get some of these terrain levels or whatever and we always would, man, wouldn't it be cool to just play a game? Like, you know, there was games like Mist and Riven and that kind of stuff. But I think it really appealed to us that kind of that kind of an idea. So I think even with Stonekeep, us like developing an entire um, uh, story behind it that really departed almost completely from what it was originally was a precursor to what we did with this. It was uh, with with um, Eclipse. It's the same kind of thing, but it was our own thing completely. Even though we turned Stonekeep into our thing. We, might be yeah. one of the reasons why it got canceled. But <laughs> I mean, to uh, appreciate the, the time frame a little bit, this, this was a, there was a, a programmer on the team uh, who wrote his own 3D engine. Uh, this is before 3D video cards. There's, there's no, you don't have hardware pushing, through, you don't have like a NVIDIA card or a, a GTX, nothing, right? It's, I think uh, video cards first started coming out when we were working on it. That was one of the problems with the project is they kept migrating to new technology as it would, and it was coming in rapid during that time. PlayStation had just come out because we were still playing Toshinden daily. <laughs> so <laughs> this is pretty, it's pretty early, uh, but I think the promise of like, you can go into these 3D world, man. We can like make our own, you could go up to this canyon tower thing or whatever, you know, you could, you could design a whole world to explore around, and I think it was the promise of that that I think we got so excited about. Yeah, um, there's actually a question a little earlier asking like how much, or was it how much easier was it to like enter the industry and get work back then versus now? And then after that one, we have a concerning question. Uh, I think, I mean, it's hard to say. It's a, it's always a moving target. I think it's a lot. It was a lot uh, less competitive back then, if you would have seen my portfolio I showed, uh, which was like two laminated cards from Kinko's <laughs> with like some drawings on them, some pencil drawings I did in Marshall's class. Uh, I sent those to Takamasta in an envelope, you know, to get a job there. And uh, I don't know if I'd hire, <laughs> hire that guy. <laughs> I mean, I did get hired at like, I got hired. It took about a year and a half, but it was, uh, at nine bucks an hour, mm -hmm. and I mean, I was, I was stoked. I was, I was getting paid to draw pictures, you know. So I was just. This is before PlayStation. This is Ninte Super Nintendo. 
technology. They still had pixel artists there at the company with the mouse and D-Paint clicking pixels. Drawing pictures like that, 32 by 32. I think they had just gotten to 320 by 240 as a screen resolution. <clears throat> that was a pretty big feat. 256 colors was a pretty big step, you know, that you could use that many colors in a picture. So, yeah, I mean, it was just a different, there wasn't a big demand for artists. I was one of the first concept artists at Interplay. They didn't, have the, the art director that I talked to that got me the job there said, hey, we're, we're kind of playing around with this. Well, it's like a new position. It's like a concept artist. One guy's doing it, Lynn, and he's kind of getting, he's kind of getting busy. So we think it might be something. There just, there wasn't an industry. There was no, if you're a concept artist, you were either probably at Lucasfilm, <laughs> working on Star Wars movies. The first ones, uh, but you didn't need to do concept art for 32 pixels. Yeah, you just it's not necessary. Mm -hmm. But when PlayStation came out, 3D cards, like all of a sudden, this the demand for uh, that caliber of artist. Somebody who can start now, uh, you know, conceptualizing in 3D space, and then also start helping to solve problems. But it's such a highly competitive industry now. It you know, I think you the the level of competition is pretty high too because of the internet. You're competing now against dudes in Czechoslovakia and China and you know, so everybody's gotta up their game. But Yeah, there's full obviously I mean there's there's full concept art schools and stuff like that. Like we're at one. There's no art station or Hub. Kind of <laughs> four art station. There's none of that kind of thing when we started. There's no online portfolios. Um we were still getting our images from books, scanning them, you know. Uh, I think the first two years we were there, there was no internet. Yeah. Yeah. That was new. So <laughs> you could order flowers for a friend. Yeah. That was the internet, right? <laughs> yeah. You could use this thing where you can order flowers. Yeah. I would imagine it's really difficult today, but <clears throat> because there's so many people to pick from, there's so many really skilled guys out there doing stuff and you can compare your work to other people's work so quickly. For us, there's nobody else doing it like that or at least we didn't know them because the only things that would carry uh, that kind of art were like Spectrum, uh, fantastic art book that came out once a year, <clears throat> stuff like that that would show you uh, like a Phil Hill painting or Rick Berry's or Brahms or whatever or you have to buy like D&D stuff to get pictures of stuff, but as far as like finding stuff online, it was, you know, it's a different kind of thing. Yeah. Like, and even now, like, concept art has kind of like carved its own, like, aesthetic, <coughs> which is really interesting. But uh, we have another, or we have a Kickstarter question. Paul asks, do you use reference when you work, and how do you suggest using reference? Uh, yeah, I'm, I'm constantly referencing something. I mean, it could be uh, photography or my own photography or uh, anything to get those qualities. I don't think it's uh, yeah, I'm, I, I think I need something in front of my eyes. I usually, if after the initial sketch, might get pieces of reference up that can hopefully help influence my hand while I'm going. So, But sometimes it's straight reference, like one a certain arm or a hand or this, you know, find something that's wow it's great it's great how those the anatomy is doing that in that pose so I'll reference those things yeah to, to paint from yeah I'd probably answer the same way it's uh, you know working on Lion King we had to reference real animals I mean we did I think both of us didn't realize how bad we were at drawing lions <laughs> you know it, the first ones we did on that job were just horrible at least mine were. <clears throat> he called but, my move. He called my Mufasa Mufatso. <laughs> such a badly drawn line. But as we would, I mean, even now, I, I still look at him. I go, I've learned more even since then. But yeah, you need to use reference. But I think you got to be careful not to let the reference cripple you. Uh, there's something really fresh and soulful about your own choices you make. But they need to be informed somewhat by reality. Like this is what a muscle really looks like, and this is what structure is, and this is what 
um, there's principles you have to kind of get down so that when you're looking at that reference, uh, you, you're not a slave to it. You're still expressing yourself, but the reference is informing the reality of, of what things look like. And what we do is somewhat representational. I mean, it's stylized, but there's certainly a, it's aiming to be representational. It's not abstract art, necessarily. Yeah, I mean, it was probably also from, <clears throat> I don't know if that was a good deal from Marshall's classes, maybe because he had so early on relied on photography, so he constantly preached against it. <laughs> In your own pieces, don't, because I think this is what, this is what drove him to want to wanna learn to draw, and then to t ultimately teach drawing, and um, so I think maybe that in the back of my head, like this is how you should use reference. Don't be a slave to it. Don't let it dictate, you know, what your piece is gonna be, you know. Don't slap down a photo and then, you know, I know if I do that anyway, even if for texture or whatever, that sort of starts to already have such a strong voice in your picture. It kind of dictates how finished this thing should be, how, you know, like here's shapes you've introduced. You've, it's, it's like you've put something in your, in your mixture, you know, uh, like a chemistry experiment that is, it's now overtaking, uh, and you don't want it to ever do that. You want it to kind of hopefully flow through you or just, you know, if your skill level's high that you can reference it in your mind, it's always great, but yeah, I don't think I, uh, I have that type of brain. It's more of like a Kim Jong-un kind of guy. Yeah, that's a little different. <laughs> but, um, would you guys like to talk more about like your experience working on like Lion King and all the other movies out there? Sure. Yeah. yeah. Was that a question or was it just just like not another question? Just oh, yes okay. or no. No. <laughs> <laughs> no. Um. Yeah. As far as Disney films or any films, I get I started on. I mean, I guess Justin should probably start. He was the first in the... I'll let Justin start. Well, since he was I, the first um, in. I think I did a, a painting of a centaur for a magic card um, 15 to 20 years ago. 15 years ago, maybe. And I submitted that to Spectrum Fantastic Art, Science Fiction and Fantastic Art, and it, it, it was in the book. And the production designer for Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe uh, bought those books, the Spectrum books, and he was looking for people who could do mythological creatures. So he saw my centaur in there, and he called me up, and I went down, and uh, he, he gave me a job as a concept artist on Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe, which, which I thought was, I, I didn't even know that was an opportunity for me. <coughs> um, I think I was there for a few months, and I, I was talking to these guys there and saying, hey, I got a buddy who could do this stuff too. And so, brought this guy on. <laughs> um, and I think we both worked on the next two movies after that. Prince Caspian and Voyage of the Dawn Treader. Even, uh, I, I, I even had the opportunity to go to Prague for three months on Prince Caspian and work on it there. Uh, brought my family with me and so forth. That was a great experience. but. Um, yeah, since then, it's been pretty much, for me, all film work. I still will illustrate stuff here and there. Um, and I've done a, a couple little jobs for game companies. I did stuff just even last year for Blizzard. And uh, worked at uh, God of War, did a few things for them uh, at Sony. But my, my main thing has been pretty much the film business. So um, we were both on Lion King for a year, right? Yeah, more than a year. Yeah. Before that, I was on Avengers, uh, Endgame, and Infinity War. Um, <clears throat> was on there probably for maybe seven or eight months, working on Thanos and uh, that kind of stuff. Um, I've done a lot of the Mar worked on a lot of the Marvel films. Worked on Guardians. One and two, uh, Avengers one, Thor two, 
Um, but yeah, I mean, we've yeah. done quite a bit, I think, in film over the last yeah. several years. It was those first Narnia movies, and that was a, f a few years of time. Uh, we still, we weren't in the union or anything. We, we both got on a film with a production designer named James Chinlin. Um, he ended up designing the Planet of the Apes, the newer Planet of the Apes movies, and uh, uh, Avengers, and Lion King. Um, but he had us on his project, and they pushed to get us in the union to, to get on that project. So they had to make a, an appeal to the union and uh, all that sort of thing. But um, that's, that's huge, you know, for anybody that's trying to get in. It's tough, and it's like this walled city. <laughs> You know that you can't penetrate and get through. Uh, you have to either know somebody, or you know somebody's got to grandfather you in. I've I've heard of some people that they've made written appeals, like, "Hey, I've done this much movie work," and they made an argument, and they got in that way. So um, multiple ways in, but it, yeah, it was it was nothing that was ever on my radar as far as wanting to do that kind of work. It sort of just fell on my lap, and then as I started doing it, I, yeah, it was part of it I fell in love with. I think I. I like the the fast pacedness of it. That you you kind of form a company real quick. An art department, you all come together, you start banging out art, and then you're you're done. <clears throat> and everything's quick, and they're in pre-production, and then they're in production, and then by that by that point, you're you're just finished, and you're on to the next thing. So uh, it's fun work because it's it's kind of high speed. When I do video game work, it's that's different. It's not as high speed. Uh, it's it's Definitely a longer, more complex process. So a lot of wheels turn in to make a video game, especially the ones they do today. Uh, but that's got a different, uh, I think that's got a different appeal. For, for me personally, I've, I've still, I've, I think my heart is for video games as far as potential of what I could do. I think I still love this idea of developing my own world. And to do that for film, there's not really an outlet for that, uh, right? Like as a, as a filmmaker, if I want to dr create something like on the Marvel level, like that's my <coughs> scope, there's, n there's no way I'm pulling that off by myself or my family, you know, to dress up like characters and I'll put some green screen up. Like yeah. that takes a huge amount of people and effort and money to pull that off. And you're also a little bit detached from the final product. You know, yeah. and I think games I always love because they're my hand can be in the final product. You know, we have a um, we have a couple of Kickstarter questions, but I thought this one related to like, what you're saying right now. Like, what is your guys' approach to finding inspiration and story for your personal projects and paintings? Since uh, obviously clips is like something you guys are doing as a labor of love outside of all of your regular work. So, what do we find for inspiration yeah. and story? And story for any work or just personal projects for yeah. personal projects and I guess paintings in general but maybe personal projects for specifically I think it just comes from from uh, who knows where it comes from honestly um, it's like a lightning bolt sometimes it just kind of hits you mm -hmm. um, I think it comes from your experience it comes from your childhood it comes from all that stuff wrapped up together and ideas would just come. We'd just have an idea. Um, sometimes it would start, us, start off as a doodle and it would just take shape and it would turn into something. Um, I could just be walking down the street and I didn't even know what I was thinking about or looking at and the idea was there. So, yeah, it's kind of a hard question to answer. I mean, it's, <coughs> it wasn't like we were looking for um, uh, something to be inspired by. I think it was just our experience, our life experience, our life experience of uh, being friends, knowing each other. Um, it just, uh, stuff just came to us. I think, I think it really interestingly reflects itself in like some of the work where it is just like a really quick sketch that maybe like you guys just thought but, of that like the kitchen table or something. Yeah, like the image of the boy on the well was really early on. Mm -hmm. We had this idea of a dry well and a boy waking up inside a dry well. Mm -hmm. And the idea that um, 
he's, you don't know whether he was asleep, how he got there, and if it was a video game experience, then you'd wake up in this well and you'd look up <clears throat> and the bucket was covering the sky a little bit and the, the way that the bucket was blocking off the opening of the top of the well almost formed its own eclipse. But you figure out a way to crawl up there and next thing you know you're on the edge of this well and on this aisle with a black sea all around you and a, a rock with a house that's sort of precariously uh, leaning off the side of a cliff almost and stuff like that. Yeah. I think those images came off really early on of, of a well. Yeah, those ones, those ones stuck. I think there's some things that didn't <coughs> stick as this idea was sort of uh, taking its own form. And then as we pitch ideas, it would be, I mean, just back and forth, have an idea. You would kind of know instinctively if it fit or not. You know, like a that doesn't feel right, or no, what, what would feel right is this, and sort of, continue, you know, take the sentence in a different way, or take that vision in a different way. So, yeah, I, I think, uh, yeah. Would you say that, um, on that note, like, a lot of times when you're hearing a front page, you're more interested in the scene, and you can see out of that? Like, I guess, like, out of that scene? Kind of like how you're just describing it. Yeah, yeah, maybe. I mean, I mean you'll, you'll, you'll see, like, if, if you look at the book, there's a few images of the well. Um, at, at some point, point I think, when we wanted to really present it as a full, uh, a, a solid idea, um, you know, you composition would enter in, and, and what's the best angle to see this thing from, and how can we light it, and some of those aesthetics would come in, so that we could best tell the story of that one particular image. But a lot of them were just like the preliminary stuff was just quick sketches and whatever. Um, even the more finished ones are, are still just constant art. It's still just, is that what it really was to look like when we made the game or the movie or, or created this whole reality? Um, but yeah, I mean, definitely, uh, like you can see this, this was really early on, I think. I remember. But it was always that kind of an idea, even the symbol of the pulley that you use to, to for a well, the shapes of that were constantly coming back, a lot of our images. As you were going through the project, were there things that popped up along the way that inspired you like from outside sources to add more ideas into the world? Yeah, I mean, the there was always that. I think we we're always trying to, uh, I mean, both of us have huge directories of references of bizarre photography and artwork and music, music and um, anything that would inspire a, f a feeling, either a visual feeling or music was, is nice because it's an emotional feeling instantly when you turn on a song. I think it's the, probably the quickest way to get to an emotion. Uh, if you want to get to a feeling, I, you can turn on the right song and then, oh, you know, like you're more than any other art form. I think visual art kind of has to work a spell on you, and it's, I think we've talked about it. There's something about a piece of art that hangs on a wall that you, de <coughs> you sort of develop a relationship with over time. You grow, you know, you start seeing other things in it, but it's, a, it's sort of a quieter magic, and music is kind of an immediate one, so, yeah. Yeah, a piece of art you can put on the wall and sort of, it can be your peripheral vision, it can be whatever, but you can't listen to the same song over and over and over again for days straight, you know, without getting tired of it. So there's different, obviously there's different. Uh, yeah, I remember they were even being songs. They were really good. And they were so good, we made sure not to put them in like a playlist. Like, yeah. Because I know I'm gonna play this one too long, too much, and I'm going to burn out on it. I'm going I'm to hate it after a while. I don't want to hate it. <laughs> I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to reserve it for a while so can, I can spend some time with it. Yeah. You almost treat them like they're some songs like It's Christmas. I'm going to let some time go by before I listen to it again so I can really appreciate it. But, 
yeah. when you would get these little bits of inspiration and you'd have uh, these ideas in your head, uh, were you thinking, oh, is it, we're going to try to fit this in our Eclipse world, or would you just do it and then kind of think back on how you can bridge the gap between these two scenes and build the story in that way? I think that, in general, um, him and I would both be in our own respective homes with our sketchbooks doodling and whatever and then we would get together and sometimes there'd be a doodle would go along with the idea um, and more often than not I think we were on the same page with it like yeah it's a great idea and so then that thing would take shape and there was never a thing like uh, how to, how to uh, delegate who was going to do which picture or that picture <clears throat> it was really more of like he did whatever he wanted to do and I did whatever I wanted to do and we talked about it and we were usually on the same page there were some times where I think one of us would be like that's just that's not quite right and I think we would usually end up being on the same page with that but I think when we fully went down to start creating this book it was um, the stuff that pertained to the story we had other ideas for other stories somewhat that were kind of like tributaries from Eclipse, like it could have been in that world, but there were different stories, more or less, that could have been at different times. Um, and so sometimes those kind of found their way into the book a little bit, trickled in here or there, but for the most part, I think uh, when it came time to actually creating the book, we put the stuff in that was part of that story. We have a Kickstarter question going back to uh, talking about film experience. Um, are those in-house, Are when you're working on big films, are those in-house positions? How long do those contracts typically run in your experience? Uh, no, they're, you know, you're, a, you're like a day laborer. <laughs> you're like a contractor. <clears throat> so you get on a, on a project and they typically, anywhere from maybe three to 10 months uh, the longer ones can run over a year. That's pretty rare, and it's nice because it's it's a paycheck every week. But you get paid on a payroll, and you're a, you're a part of a temp a temp company. Every movie forms a company, uh, has its own little name, has its own payroll. I think it's liability stuff, so they can't whatever. So sue Disney if something some liability issue comes up, and then uh, you're just a part of that department. Yeah. Justin, do you have anything to add to that? Or? He said it. Okay. That's, that's kind of how it works. It's, it's uh, You're on a job, you get to work with a bunch of people, and the next thing you know, it's over. And, and you know. find your next project. Yeah, for the most part, it's not uh, glamorous. The facilities are generally whatever cheap thing they can find. Uh, you know, it's just practical. It's all very practical, you know. Uh, Quite really often, too, you'll have the studio say, uh, they'll decide to, to chop the project and you're told Friday's your last day. <laughs> and then, uh, we have another Kickstarter question. Paul asks, uh, how important do you view inking as a learning tool for understanding picture making and value composition? Inking? Yeah. Just black and white inking? Uh, I think so. I, I, so I mean, he, he mentions a comic book artist named John Lusima. Yeah. Uh, I think it's hugely valuable. Just because inking is, uh, it's light and dark. Uh, you know, you have to solve problems in light and dark. So sometimes just mapping out a, even a drawing, just in straight black and white. I uh, wouldn't do it with ink because you can't edit it. You can't. Uh, oh, you mean like real ink? To, yeah. to, to develop compositions, I think using ink would be terrible. But him saying John Buscema, John Buscema was my hero when I was a kid. I collected all the John Buscema comics. I even got a chance to meet him at Comic-Con one year and show him my portfolio when I was just starting off. And that was a big moment for me because, you know, I get my little allowance every week and I would go down to the stop and go liquor store and buy, fill up a little tiny brown bag with candy and then buy a comic or two, depending on how much allowance I had. And they were always like Tarzan or Hulk or Conan. Um, those, those were always my kind of dudes. Those are the ones that, that uh, Buscema generally illustrated. 
So, but he wasn't necessarily an inker, he was a penciler. But what, regardless, uh, I think he inked some of his own stuff too, but I, I might be completely, this might be all in reality. This guy's full of, that's what he's talking about. But as far as like developing compositions, <coughs> I'd say using a soft pencil or whatever, something that you could edit and subtract and whatever inks, you know, you, you commit and that's it. Yeah, I mean, it's got, I think it has value in that it's a, uh, it's just on and off, and there's uh, it does force you. There is something about working with just a ballpoint pen and a sketchbook, and every decision you make is final decisions that gets you in a certain frame of mind, which I think is valuable. But uh, any time spent with any natural medium is is valuable, since we're all trying to emulate it on the computer. I mean, all the good art we like to look at looks like real paintings. <laughs> So if, we're, if that's the goal, you know, which is strange. I mean, all digital photography wants to look like old bad film photography or have all the errors and all the stuff you'd get with uh, chemicals. And uh, we're, trying, we're trying to emulate something real. So any time spent, I think, with natural medium is going to um, help. Yeah, get you at least a feel for it if you've never had one. So what are the expectations of a customer is for doing film versus maybe like an artist? What was the first part of the question? Uh, what are the expectations of a concept artist uh, in video games versus uh, film art artists? Um, I mean, I think the expectations are generally the same. Come up with cool stuff. You know, make cool things. Like what is the like, general type? Oh, as far as time frame expectations? Uh, it's, it just varies. It depends on your who's hiring you. You know, each production designer's got a different way of working. Every video game company's got a different way of working. So, but the expectations are you're going to turn out a high degree of work and hopefully a minimal amount of time. You know, do it fast and do it good. You know, uh, that's where I think most concept artists are trying to get at in general. It seems like uh, speed painting is a popular thing. Can you give us any examples of uh, time frames in video games versus film art? Um, I mean, I, I in general work the same. I, I find that uh, I've got a longer time to explore maybe in a video game project, which is nice. Uh, that that time of exploration is maybe truncated a bit on a movie project, uh, but I think I'm turning out work at the same rate. I can just do more in a video game project, turn out more designs, more possibilities, kind of have to get right to it, you know, with movie stuff, get a, maybe a couple shots at it, but again, it just depends on their time frame, which can always be shifting too, but I think in general, they're usually trying to get a certain amount of months before they make this project, depending on the size of the project, like a Lion King was hugely ambitious, you know, I mean, they had done it with uh, Jungle Book, so they had already kind of gotten their, this team had gotten their their feet wet, John Favreau and guys at MPC. So I think they already had kind of a general idea how this is going to go. That it's going to be a 100% digital. That was the new, the new thing to do. So there was some time at the beginning. I think we had two or three months before James even started. Just and and the uh, the the uh, the job was. You seen the cartoon? Draw some pictures of. Like, really? Yeah. Just draw some cool pictures of Lion King. All right. So those first few months, man, were, were awesome. I mean, they were just, doors were wide open. Like, we don't know what we're going to do. There's no script yet. The script is the cartoon. Go. You know? So uh, so that was that's fun. That's my, definitely, a, as far as uh, projects are, it's my favorite time when it's just open like that. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, in our current world, we're filled with a lot of distraction and a lot of things that information that's being bombarded to us, a lot of tutorials. How do you guys find your flow? Uh, to like avoid distractions? Yeah. Or, yeah. Just turn off Facebook. <laughs> turn your alerts off. Um, yeah. I mean, uh, finding a flow is always. Uh, 
can be a challenge because you don't know how you slept the night before or how life's going in the home uh, or whatever we're doing, but you still have to uh, deliver. So I think there's, it's a combination for me. It's uh, like a good coffee, <laughs> good waking up, or I like getting started early, you know? I like the morning hours. That's my most productive time is before lunch. And then after lunch, it's generally a different story, usually tired. And, but if I can get those choice hours and a good cup of coffee and nice music and some undistracted hours, uh, I can in general get in a good flow. I, I think it's difficult nowadays though with um, so much stimulation online. There's so much uh, imagery, you're just bombarded with stuff on Instagram or whatever, you follow people and you become addicted to checking your phone and looking at images all the time and it's, your experience becomes other people's stuff so much where it's, it, you get oversaturated with it, I think. And I think it can have a, a, an adverse effect and, and kill it and you kind of burn you out. Like you see so much of it, it's just <coughs> Where I think I would, um, I think that the challenge would be to experience things in life, go out, do stuff, discipline yourself with what you're looking at all the time. It's it's like too much sugar all the time. A little bit's fine, it's good. And pick out a few guys that you like or whatever. But I mean, you could look at hundreds and hundreds of images a day now, easily, right? hundreds of pieces of art just coming at you from everywhere. And I think, it, at least speaking for myself, uh, it kind of makes me sick of it. And I almost get sick of it doing it myself. So I think somehow like figure out a way to, to self-regulate what is coming into your mind, what you're looking at. I think, uh, I think treating that, um, that creative spark in you as an actual, uh, um, uh, what, what's the word, uh, as a fame, like that you need to protect and take care of. Uh, so it's not just full of a thousand images all the time of other people's work, other stuff. You lose your own identity, you lose your own voice. You look like other guys. Uh, that's what I see more often than not. I see a lot of stuff that looks the same. Um, I think if him and I were probably young, we'd probably have the same problem starting off now. Because <coughs> it's just so accessible, you know. So the creative flow, my advice would be to uh, turn off that stuff a little bit if you can. And try to get your own experiences. Try to find your own muse that's not other people's art. <coughs> and, uh, you know, see if you have something to say. It, the biggest thing for flow is inspiration, just like getting that fire in you, that, that passion that you just can't stop but do it. So, yeah. Yeah, I guess it's also trying not to uh, a, a good part of art is to channel. You're channeling something. You're you're a vessel, and you're trying to let that thing come out as pure as it hopefully can. I guess like with a speech, you're going to talk about some topic that you know a lot about, and when you talk about it, you sound coherent and eloquent. And but when you're when you're not, and you're trying to force it, and you're trying to maybe show to a crowd that I know about this subject and it comes out, it's not coming out with flow, it's coming out with uh, uh, you're self-aware, you're, you're awkward, you're, you, you're, you know. So a, a part of, I think, good art, when we see it, it's got that quality in it. It's got a, it's got a quality where it felt like it just, that thing just came out, like, it, like beautiful music, you know. And maybe it was rehearsed up until that point, like a John Singer Sargent or something. He did it a lot, but the final thing that you see happened fairly quickly, that thing. But everything up to that point took a while to get there. So I don't know if that helps. 
Yeah. Uh, you mentioned a lot of these were like done with like Leonard and then uh, Watercolor. Initially, that was 20 years ago? Was that the fire that or? Uh, no, a good chunk of the book happened, um, the ideas were happening 20 years ago and talking about it in real rough sketching. Uh, and then once we got funded for the Kickstarter, we basically paid ourselves from the Kickstarter to carve out some time because neither of us can just walk away for even a couple weeks from our jobs, you know, can't do it. So we basically afforded some time to actually get a lot of these images out. So kind of like all of that with, this, with everything else, like he knows that's coming from a place that's like 20 years ago, was it kind of like opening up a time capsule in our direction? Where you said like, yeah, hey, I, can, I can use a lot of this stuff that's not, you know, it looks different than the stuff coming out now because it was inspired by the stuff coming out then? I don't think so. I think it, honestly, I feel like it was like a, a snowball rolling down a hill and we were stuck in the middle of it. It was getting bigger and we were in it the whole time. Like, I never felt like opening a time capsule was always part of the thing that we were part of that was growing. So it was never like, oh, I remember that. But the one, like, that image up there on the far or the lower left, it's gone. But, uh, like, that image on the very lower left, I think I did that when I was in college. The very first painting I ever did. I had no idea what I was doing. And then I did another one maybe a year later that was right above that to the left. And uh, that was still in college, a little oil painting. I still had no idea really how to paint, how to do anything. I didn't even touch the computer at that point. Um, so yeah, uh, maybe a couple of those have a little bit of that where I remember doing that, you know. I remember taking that one little painting that, that I showed you on the very bottom there and, and bringing it over to my grandmother who was, uh, she was an artist. She actually was a cell painter on Pinocchio and Snow White. Um, she was one of the paint girls that would paint cells. And so she, uh, I would take over my early stuff, show it to her, you know. So I think it was influenced by her a little bit. Yeah, it was interesting because, you know, we had a studio at his his grandparents' house in Yorba Linda. It's a cool old house, sort of out of the 60s, 70s vibe, but all her artwork was up, up throughout the house. And I think we, I don't think we were aware of how influential those those things, as they made it like, yeah. oh my, I think we looked at them a couple times like, dude, that's like exactly what came up with like, she even had, I think, a well scene right there in the living room. Right at the, when we went into our, the back room office, you'd always pass by this painting, but I don't think I ever, yeah, I don't, I don't yeah. think I ever made a, a conscious, yeah. like, I want to make that image. Like, <coughs> it's just the fact that it was there in my periphery daily going in and then this thing would come out. So yeah, I'm a big believer in, in what you put in front of you, what's hanging in your studio it's, it's going to make it into your work. Absolutely. Like, we are all visual artists, I imagine, all, all of us here, that were very sensitive to what visually, you know, impacts our work. And so if you're looking at a ton of Craig Mullins and your stuff starts looking a little Mullinsy, or if you're looking at a ton of Sargent, or you're looking at a ton of Mobius, and your stuff has this mobius -y quality, like, it's just, uh, whether you're conscious of it or not, I just... That stuff makes it into our brains and then somehow makes it out of our hand. Uh, so those those little influences, that house in particular, even the colors, the carpet, the wallpaper, yeah. it, those colors made it into the into the book. <coughs> yeah, I think yeah. that green was was probably yep. in that wallpaper. <laughs> yeah. um, we have a Kickstarter question. All right. Do you guys plan to publish a how-to art instruction book, like just general things like either design or anatomy or? I mean, I've got no uh, plans right now. Right now, it's just the brainstorm class that I'm doing uh, with Marshall. Uh, so, a little uh, promo for that. But yeah, <laughs> we're just going to do the drawing from the master's class. It's I, I live about 25 minutes from here, so uh, my daughters are, are of an age now where they're 
really getting into art and wanted to learn more. And so they wanted to start taking classes. And I thought, well, if you're going to take classes, maybe I'll get involved too. I'll teach a class. And so they take my class. <laughs> and uh, I just kind of want to be there while they're, you know, be helpful as I can to them. There as was a growing. question back there. Hey, Justin. Hey. Hi. Oh, yeah. Sorry. <laughs> you want Vance, sorry. I, I, I wanted to, hey Vance, you were talking about your grandmother's well and stuff in the living room. Justin's um, grandmother's. <laughs> Someone's grandmother somewhere. Just, also Justin. Um, yeah. I wanted to ask, how much of the storytelling or writing process was conscious? Like, there's no script writer writing the script for you. Like, did you guys have like a character list or location list? Or we would occasionally write stuff in notebooks and uh, the dry erase board, um, things mm -hmm. like that. I think we would write down little, uh, um, could be a, like a, I don't want to say a poem, but a little more prosaic writings and things like that. But there was never really a script or a, a, a list. Did we have a list? I mean, we would. I think we had somewhat of a list at one point. From time to time, we'd just because it was kind of fun. Yeah. Cause See, we, we used, some, yeah. We used yeah. to have a thing back. We were in interplay back in video games where we would get twenty characters that we had to design for whatever game we were working on, and sometimes we'd play Quake or whatever to so see who got to pick first. Whoever won got to pick the first guy. <laughs> you always know like which guy was the coolest guy to illustrate, you know. So. That's how we pick sometimes doing that kind of stuff. But we would get a list. I, I, so that's what he said. He was saying is that we just I think we'd like to get a list sometimes. It's kind of fun. But there was never really any um, really organized script that we were going from. Yeah, I mean, other than we committed on the Kickstarter to have I think the original commitment was we were going to have like a hundred and fifty page book or or. 90 page book. I think we ended up doing 130 pages. Uh, so part of it was just dictated by filling up a book with images that we felt. And I think in the first, when we first edited the book, it had a really, I think we were looking at Andrew Wyeth books. And if you've ever seen some Andrew Wyeth books, they're, they're thick. And so we had really spread out like the drawings and we're like, this is going to, you know how much this is going to cost? Like to print this book is going to be a really expensive. We can't do that. So we ended up re editing the book and laying it out differently uh, to sort of get the book out. So part of that sort of maybe slightly dictated size, like just number of images, but there were certainly a number of images that didn't make it in that we edited out or just whatever we chose to kind of put in there. Um, we have another Kickstarter question. Uh, Paul asks, uh, do you suggest for beginners as a method to first paint tonally grayscale and add color after? I think that certainly helps regarding value. <coughs> um, do I recommend that's how you do every painting? No. Uh, but I think it's a good exercise just to be able to learn uh, where you're, how, to, how to determine values in a picture. Where's your darkest dark? Where's your lightest light? Uh, compositionally, where are all your, um, how do your values all, uh, cluster together to make a, a nice composition. But I don't say do that every time. I mean, in some cases, it's good uh, if you're working digitally to do a grayscale because um, you can color it in Photoshop with color layer or whatever. It, it misses something a little bit because I do like the feel of a brush stroke that has that determined color back in it with the stroke <coughs> rather than just being uh, tinted basically over the brush stroke which was in grayscale but it's 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 really good though for really learning value because in color you forget what value red is sometimes you know how dark is that compared comparatively with other values so yeah it's a good exercise to do I don't know if I would do it every time but certainly a time-tested approach to making paintings yeah, I think laying in uh, some monochromatic uh, value scale as your, but up until a certain point, like I don't ever want to take it to finish. 
in grayscale, if that was the question, you know, because then you are just colorizing uh, a grayscale image. So it does have that colorized photo quality, where there's a, there, like Justin was saying, there's a slight disconnect between stroke and color. Uh, but I'll, I'll often, yeah, stay in one value range and kind of knock everything out and then I might use photo filter or something and tint the whole thing and then paint in on top of that. Yeah. And, uh, do you guys want to take some more questions or do you want to take a break right now? <coughs> yeah, I have some questions back there. there. A couple more hands. Yep. Um, speaking of uh, color, um, how do you choose your colors? Do you, do you have like preloaded palettes that you work from and you mix a lot or do you just kind of go off of whatever you feel like? Uh, for me, I, um, I'll make color choices early on, and then I, I like to let colors on the piece uh, kind of dictate what those colors are. So if you put down a saturated color, you know, and then you put down a desaturated color next to it, it'll become its complement. Uh, and then that's, that's the green or that's the orange that I'm going to use. It's sort of, I'm trying to let the piece dictate which colors harmonize on on the piece rather than I don't use color swatches or any of that sort of thing and then at a certain point I'm just color picking within my own piece and then adjusting where you know like I want to take this red to, you know saturate that a little bit more I might crank it a little bit and then put that down but for the most part I'm always color picking it's one of my buttons on my you know Wicom pen is color picking and and sizing my brush, you know. Yeah. Do you have any advice about plateauing? Like, you feel like you reach a skill cap or you feel like you're repeating a process too much and you want to overcome that because you start to feel like it might start hurting your ideas and your imagination. So you, do you mean like plateauing you like feel like your skill level is not increasing? And then yeah, yeah, skill level not increasing and potentially feel like you're resorting to one formula for drawing too often. Hmm. I think one thing, um, yeah, I understand that. I mean, the plateauing happens in everything, every kind of skill you try to learn, right? There's like these big inclines sometimes, these big increases, and then there's periods of nothing. And I wish I knew what the formula was for that. I think, uh, I think, I think closely as a visual artist, I think taking your thing you're doing and comparing it to somebody's work who you really admire and really looking at it closely going, okay, I'm plateauing, I'm not getting, I'm not as good as that yet. I'm not, I'm not there at that level and, and why is that? I think you need to really look at it carefully and go, all right, what's this guy doing with edges? What's this guy doing with values that I'm not doing? What's this guy doing with form? Um, what's he doing with, and really like looking at it carefully and then looking at yours and going, I guess I treat all my edges the same. Or I guess I don't really mask my values to make interesting compositions like this guy does. I guess I don't know. I, don't, I guess I don't render light correctly like this guy does. Like this guy's got a little bit of reflected light over here. He's got this and that, and I'm kind of flat. I, I think, I think, uh, I think you have to laser focus sometimes on things and really uh, figure out where you're not matching up. And you have a lot of opportunities now because there's a lot of people you can look at and see that that. Been proven by the masses to be, I guess, good artists, right? Like they're doing stuff that most people like, where you're not getting the reaction on yours that they're getting. Um, and figuring out what it is, what's that puzzle? What's that? What's that guy doing that I'm not doing? And really, like locking yourself in a room and figuring it out, but breaking it down, like edges, value, rendering, light, you know, um, composition. Uh, color choices, technique, yeah. and look at all those separate elements and try to make a list and go, all right, how does he do that? Or how do I do that? Oh, I see what he's doing here. Like when two values are similar, he's losing that edge a little bit. 
or when it's uh, when there's a high contrast between those two values, he's got a sharper edge, or he makes that edge kind of feather out here or there, and it makes that whole line have more that contour, that that shape have life and energy, where I treated it all the same. So there's no variability in that form, in that that contour. I think he just. I think that comes with with doing this for a long time, though. I think early on it's tough to get that eye, and I think. But when you begin that process of looking at something carefully, you start to really develop your eye, and you start to be able to pick that stuff out. Yeah. Do you think another part of it is kind of just like having a standard for yourself and sort of relating it to somebody who probably has like a higher skill standard than you do? I don't understand. Because, like, if you say going into a piece that there's a standard for like visual quality that you want to go for, right? Um, is it kind of a comparative thing to another artist all the time, or? Is it well, yeah, I, I, don't, I, I wouldn't say all the time. But what I'm, I guess my point is that you're looking at pieces that you think are successful. There's a good chance that other people think those pieces are successful too, yeah. and you're not really trying to be that guy, but you're trying to break down the elements of what he does yeah. in picture making and see how you comparatively do that. And you're not, again, you're not mimicking that guy, but you might apply like, all right, I see what he's doing now with those things, forms and edges and color and so forth. But yeah, I'm not saying to, I mean, look, copying is not a bad thing to do, yeah. right? But the, the, the purpose is though is to increase your own standard of, of like, so you start picking, but you're picking it out already, that's why you think you're plateauing. So it's like you're aware of it on some level that it's not there, you just don't know how to get there. Yeah. Um, Vance, do you have anything to add? No, I agree with all that. <laughs> I agree with all of it. Yeah, it's. Uh, uh, I mean, it's a it's a big reason why I'm teaching the class. I teach the lessons from the masters. Like we're, I'm not looking at my own art, and I'm not looking at uh, Art Station. I want to look at uh, guys like Mobius and Lion Decker and Howard Pyle and Lindsey Wyeth and Arthur Rackham, and uh, I want to look at the guys who you know, designed basilicas and sculpted David and uh, yeah, I guess if we're raising the standard, there you go. Not too many people have surpassed a lot of these guys. Some of them still, they've been dead for hundreds of years and they still have yet to be surpassed and there was a reason <coughs> for it and it's probably worth some time looking at it and comparing it. Not, not to copy but to, all right. Where's the deficit? <laughs> how, how far or how close am I? And, and perhaps I'm in some ways I'm getting a little closer here. Some of you guys are working professionally, but boy, there's, not an, there's probably not an artist out there that you, yeah, it's not like you sit at the top of the pinnacle like, it's so lonely up here, there's nobody up here. I think we all have somebody we're like, they're so good, they're so good. Even at my level, doing this for 20 years, like, I feel like, you know, I need to bow and walk humbly and be before these guys are just so good at their craft that uh, makes me despise a little bit about what I do, <laughs> despise the world I live in, <laughs> this digital, you know, you know. Uh, but I think it's, it's good if it ultimately produces in you or puts a fire in you, like, okay, next piece, I'm going to try to get a little bit of that in you know, up my game a little bit, be a little more careful this time, be, you know, or let loose a little bit more. You know, we all have our different things that are holding us, holding us back, yeah. So I guess with, with that, we'll take a quick break, and then when we come back, uh, we'll jump into your guys' demos. Okay. And keep answering questions. Okay. This guy's also, we're gonna take a quick break, and uh, check, make sure to check out brainstorminland.com slash courses for all the courses we have available.
we're back. Can I move this back just a tad? Yeah. I'm not going to fall off the desk, right? So I guess I'm just going to do a little demo. Vance and I are both going to do a demo, but you can ask. We, we can answer questions online or in the audience as, a, as we're working. Um, I normally start off my my things in Painter. That's usually where I start uh, Corel Painter. That's where I start my sketches and so forth in general. I think Vance, you start in Photoshop pretty much all the time now, right? I usually go into sure, Photoshop yeah. about a third of the way through a picture. I start painting in there, and then I'll flip back and forth quite often using both programs, just depending on my mood, I guess, and you know, if, I've, if I'm using some layers, Photoshop's obviously a better answer for that. But does, um, does sketching in Coral Painter feel better? A lot better for me. Really? Yeah. Like the tactile feeling of the brushes. Or? Yeah, I think so. It's um, it just feels more um, like traditional for me, like a sketchbook. It just it has a different quality about it, but. There's two ways that I'll work. Sometimes I, I will, um, I could have just filled this whole canvas up with a layer, but I've, this isn't my normal setup, so I'm not sure exactly what everything is, so I just thought I'd do it this way. But there's two ways that I'll work. I'll either work with line, um, or I'll work with mass and kind of carve into something with shape. So it'll either be, um, um, Using Vance's brushes here. Let's see here. I'll try his nice brushy. Yeah, that's kind of cool. Um, so, I generally, in the early stages, work pretty quick. I try to work faster than I can edit um, to see if I can get some kind of flow with something see if I can get some happy accidents. Uh, I won't even, you know, I, I, I'm looking at you guys right now while I'm sketching, because I'm just letting things kind of happen. I, I, like, I like things to sort of come out and discover them as I go along. It's just, for me and my process, it's more exciting. And then I will usually find shapes within what I'm doing that, um, I'll then develop further. I might start putting construction lines a little bit if something starts to kind of come out. If this is a guy, say it's a dwarf, I'll even start thinking about the perspective, where's my eye level, and I'll kind of put some of that stuff in a little bit. So in this, with, with this approach, I'm just, um, I'm trying to go fast and I'm trying to just let stuff happen. My other way I work is to do more of a mass with softer edges. So it might be if I was doing the same dwarf or something like that. No, oh, that's wrong. Pressure sensitivity on this is really strong too. Let's see, there we go. But it might be that. I start messing the thing out with big shapes. So I might come in and then I'll go in with harder shapes or refine my brush and start finding things like Where's my darkest darks? And you guys probably have no idea what I'm doing here. How 
was wondering if there's a point where you visualize the end result. It sort of happens as I go along. Um, I kind of like the shapes to sort of, oh, that shape could be this, that shape could be that. And in the early stages, it's all just about, for me, I'm kind of working back and forth with the piece, discovering it as I go along. That's completely different than how some other guys work. That's just, you'll see probably a whole different thing than how, how he does it, but that's generally how I am, um, how I do it. If it's, a con if it's a piece of concept art, and I'm not just trying to make a, a cool shape on a page or whatever, then I'll start thinking more about, okay, this guy actually has to have some kind of design behind him, his clothing, his whatever. So I'll start bringing that stuff in as well. Again, trying to surprise myself. That's why the, the fast drawing and so forth. Um, trying to uh, surprise myself with an interesting shape that I would have picked normally is always a good thing. And I'm just roughing out like the basics. Let's try that brush. I think the second I start doing this kind of thing, the piece just starts to lose life. So for me, in the early stages, it's always important to try to go fast. You had a question? I don't have a question. Just, I asked you many years ago about the same thing, and you said something along the lines of like... Something completely at different? Time, at the time, I was like, no, 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 at the time, I was trying to plan too much. And you said something along the lines of like, you just got to trust the chaos. Did I say that? And it took me a lot of years. Well, <laughs> oh, yes, yes. Nice. It took me a lot of years. I like years. it. <laughs> Like, I would keep getting the same kind of results, right? And right. Your work always had this really organic, and every piece felt so unique and original. And I'm like, how did you do that? And just, just trust the chaos and went back to your painting. I was like, damn. <laughs> but it's really good advice. Uh, it needs to, you kind of go in with it, go into it with like, you knowing something useful will come out of it, not be scared of it. Yeah, I, and I had no idea I was going to do a dwarf. <laughs> <laughs> I think it was just the shape of the head I put on here originally. I thought, okay, he's going to have to have a small body. <laughs> Yeah, so, I mean, obviously there's times where I have a specific assignment, like I've got to do a particular piece. So it might be that if it's a full composition or whatever, there's probably a lot of sketchbook pages of me just doing lines of compositions, um, trying to find cool shapes. Like if this was a composition here, you could put it like that, and then I might find like interesting shapes within there trying to figure out a way to mask those lights and darks, and then how can I actually put characters in that? It's this idea that if you blow your eyes at something, a composition, that you see the abstract shapes of light and dark rather than exactly what it is. And I'll work backwards sometimes where I'll create the shapes of light and dark and then figure out what goes in it. Because I think a good composition is such a strong thing to have compared to um, you know, just rendering out a guy really good and then trying to figure out the composition later. Both methods probably work, right? But uh, I think in my case, I think I'm always looking for abstract shapes. I'm always looking for ways to surprise myself. Um, so when you first start out, you start out with uh, general blockages of like light and dark. 
last slide you about this art? Yeah, like I just put a um, a dark in there because I thought, okay, now that I've kind of got some of the bare, the bare bones of this guy, then where's the darkest dark going to be? Your darkest dark is usually a really saturated red in the middle, inside the nostril, or you know, there's you have real dark little like anchor points on the face or in a composition, and I'll try to find those things sometimes. Um, Pressure sensitivity on this is, you know what I'm going to do? It's pretty easy to change. Yeah, I'm going to go change that real quick. I could probably do it on the tablet, but. Uh, Just the little W. Down. The W? Yeah. Or that one. Yeah. There we go. Better not mess with that. Yeah, it's a little better. Not totally, but uh, um, so I'll take this a little bit further, then I'll put some color on it. You can see that if I mass instead of using line, there's a different quality to it. I can also like think, all right, do I want this guy to have a real strong light source? So that if he had this big nose. I spend way too much time on the computer these days. Uh, I should be spending more time on my sketchbook. Uh, I, I always keep a sketchbook, and usually I would fill up one a year, maybe. These days it's like one every two years. So No, I mean I keep getting hired, <laughs> so I think that at some point though I, I, when something needs to be like I'm on a job now, a film, and the production designer wants me to do rough stuff, and wants me to rough out the whole thing, this whole story, for, you know, in in even grayscale, just because we don't want to get into color yet, almost like painterly storyboards you know, a little more developed than a storyboard, which is kind of fun to do that. I haven't done that a whole lot, but I'm kind of enjoying it. For so when do you use uh, Photoshop for that one? I don't have a storyboard really, but in, and for this job I'm on now, um, I'm using, I'm using a painter and then a little bit of Photoshop. Same, like I said, I mean, I, I, I really do go between both. How do you main how do you mo maintain momentum going from project to project? It it's tough sometimes because uh, there's there's burnout sometimes. Um, sometimes you don't you, you do this stuff long enough. There are times where uh, you're on the clock and you don't feel like drawing or painting, but you do it anyways. And that's tough. That's tough for me. I think it's probably like any job. You, I mean, I think before you get hired, you probably think I would never get tired of it. I'd be on fire all the time. But I think I think uh, fatigue on doing something constantly is is hard to get around. Um, I don't know if I answered your question. 
What was the question again? Oh, it's, yeah. <laughs> Let's just say when you're out of a project, how do you get on to the next one? Is it like through a connection or like do you put yourself out there? Or? Yeah. It's usually word of mouth. Usually people I've worked with before. Um, sometimes not. Sometimes it could be as simple as a, a um, production, production designer seeing my name on the union list. Uh, sometimes it's it, but more often than not, it's it's guys I've worked with before that want to hire me. Um, yeah. I have a question from the chat. It's uh, how did you study anatomy, and how long did it take you to be comfortable with drawing characters? I studied anatomy. Well, I, I, st I feel like I'm still studying anatomy. Um, I think when I first started. I was taking classes with Marshall Vandruff, and I think I was fortunate to learn from him that the idea that if you want to do this professionally, you better learn the basics of anatomy. Um, so I think that I started copying from Bridgman. I started buying anatomy books. I would have anatomy books open all the time. While I was working, trying to see if I was getting a, an arm right, um, that kind of stuff. Do you usually work in one layer, or do you sometimes keep the background and characters separate? I do both. This guy, I'll probably. Um, put another layer over here and fix his values. I might take it and say, uh, let's do a little soft light on it. Tint it a little bit. Yeah. Um, I don't have really a question, but like when I'm taking a lot of these classes from uh, these great teachers, um, the nature is that you see a lot of like 3D software, and every couple of months there's this new 3D software that people are telling us to learn, and now there's VR and all this photorealistic design. And I, I know you've been doing this for like 20 years. And what is how, do you have any advice to aspiring concept artists? Like, every couple of months there's this new software that I feel like, oh, we should be learning that. And it's hard to do that while also practicing fundamentals. Like, do you have any uh, comment on that? Hmm. Uh, unfortunately, well, speaking for myself, I think I just know a couple of them. I know Painter, I know Photoshop, I know ZBrush. And I know a little bit of Moto, and that's it. And I'll use a. I modeled a lot of the lions in Lion King. <clears throat> I modeled Shere Khan for Jungle Book. Um, there's guys who are a lot better at modeling than I am. I think I'm okay when it comes to things that are just straight anatomy, but the guys that can do uh, drapery and stuff like that and do it quickly are are um, a different level than I'm at, for sure. But yeah, I think I think uh, it depends on what you want to do. If you want to be a concept artist, you pretty much need to know. Um, obviously, you need to know Photoshop, and you can take or leave Painter. But I think it's a good skill to learn with um, uh, ZBrush. Vance would probably agree with me. We both use ZBrush or comparative programs, right? Yeah, Mudbox or whatever the other ones are. My box one. Yeah? Yeah. You got it. I got it. Cool. Yeah, I didn't know you used 3D programs too. I thought you like sketched everything by hand. No, I, I mean, I, I, um, I'll do this too, where I'll go in and I'll, uh, a trick I do in Photoshop, I'll do a curve layer and fool my values.
sometimes I get results I like and sometimes not. Speaking of values, I have a question from one of the Kickstarters and they ask, uh, what do you think is the best way to learn and master total values? The best way to learn, uh, the, the way that, the way that I learned it initially, or at least the way that I really became aware of it, was probably through Marshall Vanderf, the guy who teaches here. Um, and it was this idea of, uh, he would take master studies, and he would take, rather, whether it's Rembrandt or Daumier, or um, Sergeant Wyeth, any of these guys, and he would uh, blur them out of focus, and you'd realize that they're designing shapes with values, and that kind of started to get me thinking along these lines of like um, um, composing with value, and then I think it's just that that age-old thing of, of doing your value graph, right, the nine values from white to dark. And when you look at something, <clears throat> you realize, all right, that's, that's my lightest light there, that's my darkest dark, here's my middle values, that kind of thing. You got something to add there, Vance? Yeah, I mean, I think the mark of uh, usually a student work is that there's a use of too many values. They don't know how to consolidate. So the best way to learn is to first do two values, do black and white. And if you can, you know, like a good comic Here's book artist, nice get things to read with volume, with just black and white. Uh, so you, you really only need two values, but then you add another value, a middle value, a gray, and put everything into those values and then add another one but yeah I mean nine definitely probably on the, the high end you know I don't think you want to push if you have too many values going on it's just uh, you've you've lost where you can mass shapes on your piece so simplifying those trying to get groupings Justin's mentioned massing massing which is putting those values together in groups like continents you know as you arrange them on your page, that this is all, these are all my gray, middle gray value, they're all in that range, these are my darks, this is my lights, and they create a shape and a design and they, they uh, speak to each other. Yeah. Uh, I was wondering, uh, so when you're first starting out with your like really rough gesture sketch, there's something in there that you want to keep, but then as you go further, or for me when I go further, I lose it when I like render that. How do you how do you keep the freshness going? That's a that's a tough thing. Uh, um, because I will I will kill something all the time. I think the second I start to get in there and zoom in, uh, I'll zoom in and I'll I'll maybe get that area rendered correctly, but it doesn't fit with the rest of the piece anymore. So for me. It helps to keep the whole piece viewable at the same time, so I can make choices. Every every stroke I make is influenced. You know, it influences what I do next. It's like a whole weight kind of thing. You put something here, you feel something over there. Um, probably doesn't make any sense, but um, yeah. Um, no, I'll, I'll constantly kill things because I over-render it maybe or I uh, I lose interest in it. It's interesting how you're working on a piece sometimes and all of a sudden you stop caring about it, you get bored with it, then it definitely starts to die. So quite often I'll just scrap the whole thing and do something, start start fresh. Yeah, I think that's the that's the trick, you know. Especially if you work like this, and you work from gesture to something solid, something representational mm -hmm. that you're always trying to uh, maintain its freshness, energy, 
all the things that you get in scribbling, you know. Yeah. Yes, when you splatter something, it's, whoosh, you know, it's got energy, it's got all this, you know, movement. And then as you go in there and you render and little highlights and core shadows and reflected light and this is metal, that's like, of course, it's gonna, you're gonna slow down. So I think what the, the greats do is they know how to maintain that all the way down to the final stroke. So that every stroke, everything is always, as it keeps subdividing down, you know, to your detail levels, they're still maintaining a sense of, uh, there's motifs, there's movements, they're even down to the microscopic stroke, strokes on, you know, that they flow this way and not this way, or they're making decisions all the way down. So, but that's, it's tough to do. It's tough to do. I'm just talking to uh, a buddy today, another artist. That, I mean, sometimes you make, uh, you make sacrifices, you make sacrifices to accuracy for the sake of the composition. I think I'll sacrifice accuracy if I feel like a composition stronger. Sometimes you'll edit like that's not that's not correct. But if I correct it, it's it's now lost something. It's correct, but now it doesn't feel like that. Yeah. That I like better. And so I might I'll I'll error on the side of composition over accuracy. But the hopes is to get them both. Oh, in alignment. This is more of a networking question also. It is how do you build relationships with people who are working in the business and then if you have a prospect, they say, hey, um, I'd be, I would be interested in bringing you onto this project, but then, you know, somehow like they fall out in a way, would you like try to reach out to them or follow through or? If a person you're reaching out to works in the industry and you're trying to yeah. sort of get in with them, yeah, I mean, I, I think early on I was trying to get my work in front of people that are gonna make those decisions, like they're gonna hire me. So. Like often as artists, we, we're really good at maybe, if we're online, we're really good at making friends with other artists, but those aren't necessarily people who are gonna hire us and give us money to do this. So probably better to use some time and, and try to meet those, those people either online and get your work in, in front of them. I'm, I'm, still, I'm still for the old school way of sending a FedEx of some prints to that person. So you know it gets, so they have some box to open and look at your work. Uh, that might even fare better in this, you know, in the age of just clicking, click, being clicked to death by, uh, you know, image after image or another portfolio, especially art directors that are looking through work constantly. So, yeah, you want to try to foster those relationships without stressing them, yeah. but a healthy nagging, you know, hopefully you've got to weigh that out and on the, who the person is. Would it jeopardize? a future relationship or will it you can humor it hopefully you can play it right so they're like all right i'll give you a shot you know you're bugging me i like you let's go you know so it's, it's tough so it's just a it's a social question i watch a lot of survivor so <laughs> it's generally what it comes down to you gotta you gotta learn to read somebody hopefully you know at least give them skills and how to um, I thought I saw a heart not make it so clearly that you're this the point of this relationship is that you will hire me. But yeah. which can seem manipulative and shallow. Uh, but you're also there's a practical side of it. You're trying to get work. Uh, you're trying to get your work out there. But I mean, it seems like there's enough uh, art directors and people now online through LinkedIn or whatever, you know, that you can start trying to keep your work in front of them. Uh, yeah. I mean, I've, I've had to a couple of times, just cold email a production designer. Uh, I worked with Patrick Tatopoulos on the sequel to 300. I don't know what it was called, 300, 400? <laughs> 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 but uh, uh, 
I I never worked with him before, and I didn't I didn't know him. And he didn't know me. I just I you know I found his email. Uh, list like I, I needed work, and uh, there's times I gotta you gotta hustle, and I'll just cold email somebody. Here's my portfolio, and that'll lead you. Luckily, he was, you know, he was aware of my stuff. I know your stuff, and come on down here, I'd love to meet you. And, uh, you know, worked with him on a couple of shows, so. But, you know, sometimes it doesn't always go that well, so. Got another question. Um, were you guys competitive with one another when you were going to school together? Well, we didn't go to school together, um, but we've always been competitive, and it's always been like a game. Uh, whether it's Quake or doing characters, or um, it, it was even the person who would lose, the person who would win, and whether we were playing Counter Strike or Quake or Tribes or Water, Water Cross Madness, would get to draw a picture of the other guy getting beat on the dry erase board. So we've got hundreds of drawings of us getting pulverized, whether it's through guns or motorcycles or whatever. <laughs> So yeah, I mean, even with concept art, with stuff, it was always a kind of a fun like uh, uh, challenge, you know. Yeah. Going back to the industry, you guys said it's harder to get into like movies and the, that side. Would you say it's easier to get into like the video game side, or is it pretty much the same cold calling and trust? I mean, I don't know. We uh, got into it at a different time, you yeah. know. So, but I, I think I'm pretty aware that there's there's challenges for someone coming right out of art school, even at a high level of skill. Um, they're competing with more people than I was competing with, or Justin was competing with. But uh, I think the advice is always the same, you know. I think you have to strive for some greatness or distinctness in your work or uh, if you can't do that be a good worker you know try to try to get that game I mean you, you're gonna have to use utilize your uh, your strengths and play to those strengths uh, we work with some guys that are just they're just really good at uh, kind of doing the brunt work you know I think we've been lucky enough to, to have a uh, jobs that cater to the work we like to do and so I would always advise uh, young students to try to get the work you want to do so early on uh, which I, I would get in trouble because I would uh, I, I wasn't a good listener <laughs> to, to what the job was I think I get excited about what I wanted to do you know like oh this would be cool but I don't nobody actually asked me to do that uh, but I think doing that over time <laughs> helped to shape what I do today, you know, that uh, it did help. Uh, my own knuckleheadedness uh, helped that I get to do the work now. I'm working with guys that hire me to do like, oh, I want just loose paintings and we want a painterly style or those are generally guys that are calling me, me and guys like Justin, you know, uh, they're not calling us to do other types of work. So, if you fancy a certain type of work, then try your best to do that work. You know, <laughs> my advice now would be follow directions, do the job first, and then. By the way, I did this on the side. I stayed a little late, and I did this. What do you think? You know, try to edge in your your vision or the thing you want to do or the style you want to do as much as you can, and hopefully it catches enough that you become the guy that does that thing, you know? I'm not getting any pressure sensitivity, by the way, on my tablet, so just so you guys know, it's why it's so, uh, I'm wandering around so much trying to, yep. You can try go on Windows and then- Go on where? On the top apps, uh, which is top. So go on Window, right next to it, and then click on the brush, on brushes. Uh, brush settings Where are we? Oh, oh, just oh, there we go. Yeah, brushes. Brush settings or brushes? Uh, just brush. Oh, okay. 
um, go back to the window. Yeah. 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 And then you could uh, shape that oh, transfer. Ah. Transfer. Uh. No? Shape oh, dynamics. Yeah, it's transfer. Yeah, it's transfer. <laughs> what brush do you have? <laughs> you gotta click on it doesn't matter. All of, them, all of them are kind of doing the same thing. See? Oh, yeah. I usually hit my tablet. Probably, uh, <laughs> 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 Yeah, so you could do that. Yeah. 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 yeah, minimize. Minimize Photoshop and bring it back up. See if that works. Did it just die? You trying to plug me That looks like it's back. Let's see. Oh, yeah. oh, all right, there we go. It's been gone for a while, so sorry. I uh, probably should have said something sooner. I try to keep talking. <laughs> so going back to the question about plateauing, yep. would you say that the one of the things to help avoid that is to just keep on expanding on your uh, the principles and elements of design and just pushing things that you've never really done before. I think it's that's good advice. Yeah. Yeah. Definitely. Oh, just a heads up, you got 15 more minutes till, okay. till swap. Okay. And there'll be no break in between because there's time. Jeez, please. Yeah. What kind of advice would you give somebody who's been working in a certain type of uh, industry, not just video game and film, but like advertising, who wants to go into video game and film and emphasize that they've been working under art directors for like years in their resume, or what kind of would you emphasize who wants to change industry, cross industry, who is an illustrator, but to sheer toward the direction mm -hmm. where they have any experience in the video game or entertainment history. I mean, I think I think you just have to demonstrate in your portfolio. I think early on, I would always put together specific portfolios to who I was trying to get that work from. So, if it was uh, more slick futuristic spacey stuff that's who I'm trying to get I'm trying to get onto that job and I'm always gonna gear my portfolio towards that or if it's loose papery fantasy watercolory art then I'll pick the pieces that demonstrate that so for somebody trying to I mean you can't show your portfolio from here's all my design you know for uh, these products I'd love to do video games though like you're just gonna have to demonstrate on your own time or whatever put together a portfolio that demonstrates that you can do that type of work. Right. Yeah. Do you think also if you do that though, putting in an idea of taking direction from art directors for years mm -hmm. uh, in the advertising industry would help like in the resume? Not just having the portfolio in front of them, but knowing that you can take direction as well. Because anybody can have a good portfolio, but whether you take direction well, it can be a completely different thing. Yeah, it could be. I guess it just depends on what that uh, employer is looking for. If they're looking for a, a soldier, you know, and you need to demonstrate you're a good soldier and you follow directions and you can modify, or, you know, then that's a valuable skill. Uh, I think most of them are going to want to be wowed. This is visual art, you know. They want, you want to uh, try to knock their socks off. Uh, and I think if you can knock their socks off, they'll generally willing to put up with personality flaws <laughs> up to a point <laughs> before you get fired uh, but most artists are temperamental they're moody they're uh, have up and downs I think it's kind of known uh, industry-wide we're a mess so um, but I think demonstrating strong skills would be number one and skills w within that area so uh, I don't know how I think it just depends on the employer how your ability to take, like that you're a good employee translates well. I don't know if they're looking for that. It just depends on the uh, person you're talking to. Yeah. I have a question for Justin. Sure. About like when you get to this part of the process and say you start painting a specific subject matter in your uh, 
early phase and you start to get a little confused about how to execute it, would you go in and find a reference to kind of figure that part out? Like say you couldn't figure out a hand or a, an arm or a weapon. Mm. Maybe, but you, it, usually not for like a hand or an arm, but for a weapon maybe. Um, usually I'll just make it up if it's a, a hand or an arm. I think I, I've, right. <laughs> I can get around with my anatomy enough, and right now it looks like it's just blobs, right? But as, as you go along, you start to refine you know, I know where the ulna is, I know where that furrow is, where the extensors lie on top of it, I know where the brachioradialis is, come up here and how that comes over here to the part of the radius. You know, I mean, you kind of learn that stuff and then apply it, uh, but you have to kind of get into your subconscious a little bit, you got to kind of dig that stuff in so that you can paint quickly and you just you start to get understanding of the body, muscles, and so forth. Um, so I don't really worry about that part as much. I still uh, could get better, to be honest. What about the part where you're like maybe painting a subject matter which you've never even studied before? Yeah, I like like lions. Um, for Lion King, that's what we were talking about earlier. Definitely is the case where we had lots of lion references up. We were constantly, uh, I probably got the world's record for the most lion photographs on any computer. Because <laughs> I was so much trying to get it right, you know, and you keep thinking you're gonna find just that right reference. But, um, Yeah. Yeah, if somebody tells you they don't use reference or they don't ever look at anything, they're, well, <laughs> Kim Jong I, mean, I was going to say they're a liar, but no, not that guy. That guy. Not that guy. You guys were talking about music earlier. What kind of music are you guys listening to, listen to when you draw? Do you like a specific genre or is it based on movies? It's, it's everywhere. For me, I got so many. Honestly, I, I don't have a favorite. There, it just depends. Like if it's a, if it's more of a war piece, if it's edgier, I'll listen to something that's a little more revved up for me. Uh, if it's a quieter piece, you know, it's it. Usually, I'll, I'll listen to stuff that fits the move, the mood of what I'm illustrating. I'll, I even used to make playlists for for paintings. You know, have a whole playlist that just fits that painting. <clears throat> yeah, same here. It's the, it's the uh, yeah, you find that music, especially as you're painting, uh, maybe because there's strokes involved, there's a certain, um, there's, there's rhythm that comes through it, you know, when you get in a, in a zone. The strokes are kind of going even with the music, that they're, uh, um, it's a performance quality to it, you know? I think when it's all going well, that's not all the time. But yeah, always varied. So it's five more minutes? Okay. Yeah. I mean, I can stop any time. This isn't anything I'm going to... And we have another question online. It's how do you determine when you're done with a piece or when it's good enough for you? Um, it's a good question because it's usually never good enough for you. It could always be better. And when you work digitally, you can always foreseeably make something better. And you have to weigh in diminishing returns, the job you're on, am I losing all kinds of money doing this, painting the same thing a hundred times? Uh, at what point do you call the quits, really? It's usually not because it's good enough. It's usually because uh, I've got to stop and do something else, you know. Normally I would have put a cool highlight on there against a warm surface, but 
That'll be. This will do. Sure. And the kind of setting that it is, um, it seems like it's a bit of like a, like a post-apocalyptic kind of thing, because it seems like there's a lot of buried ruins, and it's like civilization rediscovering itself. What was the whole theme exactly? Some of it's a secret. <laughs> <laughs> Most of it's a secret. <laughs> And uh, the only reason for times in the past where I've tried to explain it weakens it for me. Okay. I feel like I'm trying to put a label on it, and uh, I like where it sort of I like the space it exists for myself. That's a really a cop out answer, <laughs> but um, That's a good answer. yeah, there's all kinds of. Uh, That's a whole other conversation. That you'd have it had to be the right day to want to go down that path. So a lot of it is metaphorical. Then? I think so. Yeah. Am I out of time? Uh, All right. I lost my pressure again. studio because you like what they do. Uh, the studio sort of has its own distinct qualities, you know, or types of projects they're working on. So this is tough for any student because you don't usually have a portfolio or you have like four pieces. I think most studios will know that if you're a student. But I think each time I would get a job that would make it into my portfolio. <laughs> Get another piece in there, another piece, and you start building it, and then you can start hopefully, you know, pushing work this way or this way, or trying to get the work you want to hopefully do. You know, for me, I I wanted to work at Interplay. I played their games. I played Blackthorn, and uh, I played Rock and Roll Racing, and I love the character portraits in Rock and Roll Racing. All these characters. I, thought, I want to do that. That looks so cool. And that's why I put together a portfolio of character heads with like futuristic looking, you know, cyberpunk heads that weren't that good, but it's, it's what I wanted to do, you know. I was trying to get that kind of work. That game was already done, you know, they weren't, I ended up working on the sequel to it. <laughs> and doing character portraits. <laughs> so I kind of got the job I was hoping for, you know, ultimately. So, yeah, you got to try to aim where you're going and try to get there, you know. Is this the same for film? Um, for film, it was different because Justin asked me if I wanted to work on a movie, you know, he recommended to me and I got a call and I had already been working for eight years at a video game company, so I had quite a bit of work. And it was all fantasy genre stuff, so it kind of fit my original wardrobe and um, that, that sort of work. But yeah, uh, when I was, I think, uh, when I was working on Thor, I worked on the first Thor movie, 
and I may have shown some work I did for Epic Games for Unreal 2. I think it was Unreal Tournament 2. And we I've done some sci-fi designs, which I didn't have a lot of in my portfolio. I just had that, and I think I showed that. Maybe a couple other things. Uh, knowing that this is going to be, you know, space Vikings. <laughs> so uh, it wasn't a lot, but it was enough to get me the job, and I got it. So. Yeah. It's funny because uh, Charlie One, he did the art for God of War 1 and 2, I think. Yes. And he got the world, so. I know. So, yeah. So, I know. It's a small world. I know. I know. Now I'm working on like, God of War. And I see Charlie Wynn pieces up in the studio. The little gallery. Yeah, I worked with Charlie on Guardians 1 and uh, Thor 2 at Marvel. Oh, yeah, that's all the okay. time, I'm sorry. <laughs> that's all right. Well, that's another demo. <laughs> <coughs> and now Dan has a pop of you. <laughs> yeah. Uh, that'll be easy. I don't know about that. I like these guys. my naming convention. Alright. I'm a little tired. So you're gonna get a tired drawing. An after work tired special. I think, you know, I'm similar to Justin's approach. I think I work sometimes linear, where it's more line. And then sometimes I'll block in a uh, picture with shape uh, over line. And it's the same kind of thing. I think it's rapid. It's looking for uh, opportunities to present themselves more than a full dictation. Sometimes it's, I'll go into a piece and there's a strong, uh, there is a strong image maybe. Uh, that's certainly not what's right now. It's no strong image. So I'll, I think I'll dot around a bit, you know, find something. Would you say that's a good way to design shapes? If you're trying to like, just get good, like attractive shapes and things? Do you have like something that you recommend for a shape design? Yeah, I think it's, it's maybe, yeah, it's a little bit of a, the gymnastics of it, getting some shapes down, um, and then trying to find little shapes within that or little, it's, it's happy accidents. Is that a Bob Ross term? <laughs> happy accidents uh, sort of present themselves and then, um, Capitalize on them. Do you feel like you repeat shapes all on your work? Like certain that you can gravitate towards certain shapes and things? Uh, yeah. So, like, you think it's more like subconscious, though? Yeah, I mean, I guess it's that thing when you look at someone's work and you see them in it. 
like, oh, that's a that's a so-and-so or that's a so-and-so. It's probably because of the shape language they use. Um, I mean, sketchbook stuff for me. Tried to do some acrylic painting this past week, which was a failure. <laughs> but um, try to here and there. Uh, less for me than 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 probably Justin. Uh, yeah, I'm trying to always work in my sketchbook. I'll use gouache or watercolor. I have an easel in my studio. I I'll do oil paintings. I haven't done them in a while, but <clears throat> um, that's probably my favorite. I'm just gonna ask what well, like the comparison and like being able to do like gestural stuff like this and get interesting shapes. I, I find like I, I that I can do that a lot with a uh, pencil and with oil paint as well. Oil, oil paint, it's, you can rub stuff out. You can get all kinds of happy accidents and get all kinds of, uh, I mean, obviously you don't have the undo abilities. Yeah. With my sketchbook, a lot of times I'll draw and then erase a lot of the drawings on there and it leaves a faint trace of other stuff behind there and then I'll find stuff in there that I'll develop. And I like that kind of thing. I like the things on top of other things and um, sort of thing. I think a lot of, what drives me with this stuff is the idea of discovering things, surprises. I should have, I should have probably brought my own brushes, my own Photoshop brushes and stuff. And I just decided to use his. And a little clunkier for me, but that's all right. So in terms of finding those forms and the anatomy and stuff, and like having things appear before you, um, that comes from experience or like that comes from you like taking classes or like doing workshops where you're studying like anatomy and stuff or? Um, not for, nowadays if I was doing it, I probably wouldn't even go to art school. I'd probably just, there's so many videos online. How many of you guys are in art school? <laughs> More of this kind of art school, <laughs> as, as opposed to the ones. Look, and there's look, if they were cheap, and yeah, I'd say go to art school too. Uh, but gosh, you can learn so much now from online videos and tutorials and workshops, right? Back when I was starting off, it was uh, pretty much Marshall Vandruff and a guy named Don Lagerberg. Cal State Fullerton uh, and from what I didn't learn from I could have learned it more from Marshall if I would have paid more attention but I think he lit this idea that I needed to learn this stuff so I would just get anatomy books and copy them and whatever piece I was doing I would find uh, a corresponding anatomy thing so my earlier drawings all the muscles were like really like defined like Look like they had no skin on them, but uh, that's kind of how I started to learn it. Also, in terms of uh, looking for feedback from professionals, how would you go about doing that? Like, say we're like from the outside and stuff, and we want to get feedback on our own work. Like, how would we go? About that's a tough one because I've I've gotten really bad at responding to stuff. Uh, I think you just keep trying. Like when I started off, um, I, again, there wasn't the online thing. So I went to Comic-Con and I showed my portfolio to guys I liked. And I, you know, you want them to look at it and validate you. So I think now, I mean, there's so many talented guys that are doing stuff. And some of them are really good at responding, I think. Like, they seem to be very interactive. I don't know. Um, 
I would just keep knocking on the door. Is that what you're asking? Like, how do you get people to respond to you? Um, yeah, something like that. Like, without harassing them too much or, like, bugging them. So, yeah. I know. How's it work? How's it work? Vance really responds to getting poked. <laughs> like a so Facebook you poke? Realize attention. Whether Facebook or you see it in person, you want a response. You know, poke them in the back. Facebook no, pokes poke are anybody. the most effective Kick way to get any kind of communication. No, I don't know. Um, yeah, I, I don't know if I have a really good answer for that one because everybody's different and, uh, yeah. Have you had a bad experience with that? Mm. No, but I have had Yeah, I sent you an email, Justin, and you never responded. <laughs> 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 yeah, well, that was a very uh, I think it's um, maybe has something to do with uh, you figuring out for yourself what you really want and where you want to be. Um, I mean, that's, I think I just had a, I think the path was always pretty lit up for me, what I was after. And I just think I loved doing this stuff in the early days, and it just kept, I couldn't wait to go into work the next day and do more. I don't think I really thought about, okay, where do I want to be in two years? I think I was just happy painting and drawing pictures and getting paid for it, for me. Um, I never really looked at it like, what's the next thing, you know? I think uh, I got some good advice from my wife's grandfather when he was uh, his last days of life. I'm going to get deep here. <laughs> but I asked him, I said, what would you say to the rest of us? And he said, make every day your best day because you never know what's coming around the corner. And uh, there's, there's really sound wisdom in that. This guy was almost 100 years old. It's, uh, you don't know what's coming around the corner. So I, I think, does that mean you don't plan? No. But uh, I think, I think, uh, I guess my answer to your question, my long-winded answer, would be to really enjoy that day and what you're doing and, and try to do the best job you can do at it. And uh, I think things kind of have a way of like, sorting themselves out, possibly. Want to add to that, Vance? Save me. <laughs> well, <laughs> I wasn't paying attention. Sorry, what was the question? <laughs> no, I was, advice for, what was the, how did you word the question? He, he was a, uh, he, when you're a mid-level artist. Yes. And what's the next step after that? Like. Yeah. Yeah, I, I I think I maybe we were mid-level artists around the same time. <laughs> if whatever a mid-level artist is, I still feel like a mid-level artist. Yeah. Um, I think I I was so uh, maybe blinded a little bit by the excitement of what I was doing because I really liked what I was doing. You know, the job I had, I was I was happy. I don't. I don't think I was trying to plan next steps. I sort of just ended up in places like film, 
wasn't a plan. It was an opportunity that presented itself that it jumped on. So I think that is a part of it, is when a, uh, an opportunity presents itself and you got to make a choice, you got to make a kind of a path decision this way or this way, uh, that you hopefully have the wherewithal to make the right decision, get yourself positioned. I think I, I think a little bit more long term now. Maybe that's just part of age. Around when 40 rolled around, I, I think I start thinking beyond the week, beyond the month, perhaps a few months down the road. Uh, and so I'm trying to position myself always to do the work I want to do. That the, the short term, that if I do this job really well, this is going to open up hopefully other opportunities to do more of this kind of work. I don't know if that's answering the question, uh, but I think I've heard that sentiment from other artists, a, a frustration maybe where they're at, like, I don't want to be here, I want to be doing that. I don't know if I ever really had that as much. I think I loved it in games until, and I kind of wrote it until it dwindled and then tried to get into films. Or, I mean, I got into films, got an opportunity, but I had no idea what I was doing. So I, uh, I didn't know how to get that kind of work. So I went back into games, you know. I worked at a studio for a whole year, commuting from where I'm at now, here in Eastvale, Corona, to San Diego every day uh, for a year. My second daughter was born during that time. Uh, it was rough, you know. It was a challenge, I mean, but I didn't know how to get income any other way other than game studios, so I worked at a studio. and. I remember a couple little freelance jobs. It's when I did my first D&D &D cover was during that time. Um, but I, I got up probably 5, 6 a.m., yeah, 5 a.m. every morning, drove down the 15 for 80 miles, you know, went to work, went back home, saw my wife like at 10 p.m. or so, got up again, did the same thing. So uh, I did it for a while. And then towards the end of that, their, their studio was falling apart too. And they, uh, they were going to require saying, hey, can you start uh, coming in on weekends? And I said, uh, no. <laughs> I, I don't see my family as is. I, I can't do that. So uh, I, had a, I basically put in a year there. I thought, I'm going to commit a year. I committed my year. I did it. And I had one freelance job with uh, Midway Games for some conceptual work for some game. They're like, we got three months guaranteed work. I'm like, I'll take it. And that was it. I went off on three months of guaranteed work that really ended after one month. And so I quit the, my job, had three months of work that turned into one month. Uh, I think we started doing stuff for whiz kids during that time and some uh, like pirate head portraits, which we did hundreds of. and. Uh, then I got an, another call, like email would start coming in, you know, and just sort of piecemealing my work together, going freelance. But it was uh, not easy. But I think you have to be willing to push through that next level. And, and perhaps that's what guys who are working in the places now, that, that's how they got there. If they just push maybe a little harder than the next guy. or And you got to push. And students now have a... We, you do have a harder road in some senses, I guess. There's a bigger pool of talent out there, so you're going to have to push a little harder. But I think, I think because of it, you're, you know, maybe the the whole art form is growing. You know, the type of students that are coming out now are, are just perhaps they're, they're they even know more. Don't know. So in terms of art education, um, do you guys then? Did you go to Art Center or like any of those places? No, I went to I went to F I, I went to FJC, Fuller Division College, and then I went to Cal State Fullerton, and then I uh, I had two classes left before I graduated, and I got a job at Interplay, and I had a kid who was maybe a year old, or maybe even less than that, and I always thought oh, I'll go back later and finish up school. Well, 25 years ago, didn't happen. 
but in this industry, nobody really cares about your diploma. They care about your portfolio. But um, no, I think I admired a lot of the guys that came out of Art Center because I would see that wow, these guys really know their stuff. They know perspective, and they all had a certain look. Might be one of the things that that uh, differentiated Vance and I because I think ours was a little cruder, not so polished, not any better or worse necessarily, but just came from a different place. We didn't go through that formula, you know. Do you think learning traditional media, pencils uh, slash oils, is important even if you work in digital? I do, yeah. Again, I think you're, uh, we're all emulating. This is an emulation of what you would do with real paint, how you'd lay down real paint or real pencil or real ink. And the more you can ape that quality, I, I think, uh, the more authentic the piece looks, you know, less of a digital trick, uh, more of a, a piece of art that we all like when we go to museums or whatever. So I think there's a, there's always benefit working in natural media. Those those skills will just gravitate over. I learned on the computer first. I didn't paint traditionally, uh, and I still don't really paint traditionally. But everything I look at is traditional paintings. You know, so. I, I, would, I it, that's how I started with traditional media. And I think I, I really gravitated towards uh, the John Singer Sargent, Soroya, Zorn, these guys that would use a brush stroke to define an area. And I, I found that hard to do digitally initially. Um, I think that's why uh, I think I even prefer paintings now that that have a little more of that hand in them of a, a stroke rather than a really finely super polished render which those are beautiful in their own way that's just not my thing um, but I think that comes from the kind of painters I was interested in uh, but do you have to learn that stuff? I, I don't think so. I mean, you could do your sketchbook now on an on a iPad Pro instead of an actual paper and pencil. So it's all kind of the same. It can't hurt. How do you guys, uh, like, increase your, like, visual library? You guys just like learn something as the project like meets it, or like daily do you guys like read books or magazines or stuff like that? Or? Usually, as the project goes, like I think I always wanted to learn how to get better at drawing animals, and so the next thing you know, I'm working on. And that's one of the reasons why I worked on Jungle Book, and then. Uh, Lion King came around and I thought, well, this would be a great opportunity to get paid to learn how to draw lions. <laughs> and uh, after that, I went to Call of the Wild, and it was Mouse Guard, and it was another, so I almost had my fill of animals. Is there any chance that Mouse Guard can hmm. will be revived? I have no idea. It's a shame. It awesome. cause, <laughs> it's a shame because. Uh, there was some cool stuff going on there, and the director was a cool dude, and he had a cool vision for the project, and it's really a shame, but that happens all the time. Were they, were they even casting actors? Yeah, I think some of them yeah. went up on Twitter. And they had Miss Patmore from, from uh, Downton Abbey. I think she was your the mouse with the, the glasses. Abigail? Oh, that's right. They had already done a little test with her. It's funny how uh, it just came on the house and house. Yeah. Like with Disney. I mean, since their mascot is Mickey Mouse, they could actually try and develop this more. But, uh, 
Yeah, I, I, I don't have any, I, I don't know the reasons for it, but yeah, that happens a lot. Oh yeah, that leads me to my next question. It's like, when you're on the project and you're developing it for a like, long time, all of a sudden it gets shelved. I know it might be very taxing emotionally. How do you bounce? I mean, how do you like rebound from that? Or like, how do you keep going? Well, for me, I always considered every concept or every picture I was working on to be its own little end. So apart from whether they used it or not, or whether it even eventually made it into the movie came out, I felt like those those things were my own little thing. They're my own little finishes. So sure, it would have been nice. It's nice when the director picks your concept, and let alone when the movie gets made and you see your designs in the movie. That's nice. But I think the bigger payoff for me is just doing that image, so it's a, its own standalone thing. So I, I mean, I think it's worse though for like a director where the whole thing is his art. So it's a, uh, we're, we're, ours are very individual, like day-to-day -day pieces that we're work, working on, but his is the whole ensemble of everything. So that's gotta be heartbreaking. I don't know, I, I mean, I guess they bounce back because they, Keep going, keep trying to make another film. Justin, you mentioned uh, looking at uh, students that come out from like Art Center and how it seems like to have their kind of formula. And your experience with the video game industry or the film industry, do you, are you met with studios that um, want you to follow a certain formula or are they just like, all right, here's your style, we want you to run with it? Or do they ask you to establish a formula so you can um, conform to their vision? No, I think for me, generally, when I get hired, they know the kind of stuff I do. And so they hire me to do that kind of stuff. So uh, they just, if they want somebody that does really nice, polished backgrounds in the art center kind of style environments, then they're probably not going to knock on my door. I, I don't think I've ever been asked, like, hey, I hired you, but I want you to paint like one of these guys over here from Art Center. I don't think that's ever happened. Oh, uh, okay. I was wondering, like, in some processes, it's like, we want you to, like, or sometimes with artists, it's like, I do, like, 50 thumbnails, silhouettes, and so the studio kind of expects that from a lot of other like, constant artists or illustrators. So I don't know if some studios have taken that. Well, that just not how you operate. Well, if they asked if they asked me to do fifty thumbnails, then they are expecting that I'm going to do those fifty thumbnails in my style, my thing. So that's different from um, style as compared to uh, assignment, you know, like. But I, I, nobody's ever really said. I'm hiring you, but I want you to change your style to fit this. I think there's enough guys out there where they can find a guy that does the style they're looking for. Some production designers, you know, they have different preferences for kinds of guys they want to work with and stuff they want to do, and you know. But I haven't had that experience really. I'm sorry? Will clients enjoy your stuff? Like, they like what clients enjoy my stuff? Yeah. I don't know how to answer that. Clients <laughs> get hired for, I guess. Um, yeah, I guess the ones that pay me to do it. <laughs> They're willing to put money down on it. So I. Yeah, I, I guess that's. Well, my resume, um, I've, uh, 
let's see. I mean, I just, I'd say the biggest one's probably Disney because they own Marvel. And they, I've done a lot of work for Disney because of all the things that they uh, control. So uh, I've done a lot of work for, um, I mean, there was Jungle Book, there was Lion King. Um, I can't remember. I mean, I've, I've worked on a lot of films now. I'm trying to think. Yeah, do you have an answer for that one? Um, sorry, say the question again. <laughs> it was... Uh, well, about clients like in early style. I, I think it's just, it's mixed. It's generally a personal preference. Some people hate it. Yeah, it doesn't describe any, you know, some people love it because it gets them to uh, where they want to go with their project. Uh, guys like James Chenwin, uh, he's a very artistic, sensible guy, like a designer. He designs really from feeling and emotions and shapes, and so I've had a real positive experience working with him. Um, he'll always tap us for projects he's on. So, and there's a few guys like that. I mean, you just get, I think, um, a working relationship with these guys. That's why I think it's also difficult to get into film work because it's a very, uh, that that saying that's not what you know, it's who you know in Hollywood. It's 100% true. I mean, every job I've been on, I get asked, uh, who do you know that's available? You know this guy? You know, like, it's 100% it's relationship because they don't want to, the time is is condensed. It's, we're going to get in this thing, and do I want to, as an employer, risk the time, the investment, to invest into someone I've never worked with before? Yeah, maybe their work looks good, but maybe they're horrific to work with. I don't know. I want to work with somebody that, that I've either worked with before or somebody that comes recommended. It's just, I think it's, a, it's discretion on their part, you know, just to maximize the time that they have. I think most employers are kind of looking at that. But movies is especially, you know, because the time frames are condensed, the budgets are high, you're going to hit the ground running, and they, they want to be able to produce. So uh, I think I went on a rabbit trail. What was I saying? What was the original question? Just, <laughs> sorry. It's late. Uh, question, uh, I guess, like, what studios, like, Henry, style versus, like, what you think about Hollywood movies? Probably not so much a studio as it is whoever the art director is. I have another question from the chat. Uh, what does your character design process look like? Kind of like what we're demoing tonight. <laughs> a little, little bit. Um, yeah, it's a similar. Approach. So for me, I, I have trouble with like deciding. Well, for a while, I had trouble with deciding what I wanted to do because um, I know a lot about like using Photoshop and After Effects, and then I want to do like a painterly style, but then I want to do props, but then I want to do environment. How do you focus yourself into like just one thing or like? Well, it's usually determined by who hires me. Um, I think in general, working on a film, for me, it's always like a combination of character work and keyframes. Um, sometimes there are environments involved. It just depends on what's the need and who he's got working for him and how he delegates those jobs. Maybe somebody that's on the project would be that is really good at environments. Maybe somebody's good at creature design or whatever and it might be that kind of a thing. Or it could be a thing where <coughs> everybody's given the same task 
like in character design work, and everybody comes up with their take on it, and then those takes get presented to the production designer or the director, and it's then a selection process. But as far as um, I think I'm fine doing any of it in general. <coughs> About 15 more minutes. Right. I have a question. You guys are talking about like driving, you know, you're driving up to like San Diego. Mm -hmm. Do you have any like big struggles that you kind of overcame to like advance your art career? Anything memorable like that stick with you? Um, along with that? Mm -hmm. Other struggles? Yeah. Um. No, they they always seem to present themselves. <laughs> yeah, I mean, there's always a work, home, family balance that you're trying to strike. Um, Is that Maynard from Tool? <laughs> <laughs> That is Maynard. You got it. <laughs> <laughs> Did you guys think of the new album? It's my first time listening to Tool, to be honest. I've listened to Pucifer and yeah. uh, Perfect Circle. I don't think I ever listened to a Tool album. That's because they haven't come up with this new one came out after like how many years? 10, 15 years? Yeah, but they released the whole catalog on Spotify, yeah. right? So I started listening. I dug it. It's cool. I haven't listened to the new album yet. I, I will though, I keep forgetting about it. This is good. <coughs> a question from someone online. If for someone trying to get their foot in the door, would you su suggest aiming the portfolio for a specific niche or emphasizing the strength and space in It's hard, I mean, because it's, it's strategic to who you're presenting to. Uh, what they're looking for, what job you're looking at, you know. Uh, so I think I was trying to, you know, when I'm putting together portfolios early on, I'm trying to cons trying to consider all those as much as you possibly can. Um, but it's, it's difficult because you can't predict exactly what they're looking for, you know. So, but I would I would tend to um, tailor to that job that I'm. I'm looking to get, you know. If it's more of a generalist, then yeah, show lots of uh, show a wide variety. If you think you're going to be a sort of a studio artist, you know, kind of do a lot of different tasks or low-level tasks. Or if you're shooting to be, I want to be the keyframe guy. I want to be the head concept artist. Then just show that and go for it. Justin has more. I would say at least get good at one thing. Really good at it. Maybe I'd say that. Rather than spread yourself thin, like maybe start start with one thing and get proficient at that, and then expand it. Learning ZBrush or learning the maybe your character guy learn environments because it definitely increases your um, your skills that uh, are hireable the more the more you have in your tool bag the more you know potential jobs you get you want to make a living doing this stuff are there any clients that you guys had who uh, if they call you up and ask you to work with them, that you'll be like, no. Yeah, probably. We can't mention them on the live stream. <laughs> right, I know. <laughs> <laughs> it's a very general question. <laughs> yeah, definitely. Not me. No, <laughs> Uh, 
decided to um, like really push that light right to the center there. Like, was that like an accident? Not like accidental, but like just kind of experimenting and seeing if it looked good, or was it intentional? Um. Yeah, some of it's just fatigue at looking at this thing and trying to push it. So, yeah, I think it's always a little bit experimental. And I might look at it again, not like it, edit it out. Maybe I'm always trying to be willing enough to tear the whole thing down, uh, to, to build it back up, to don't get too committed. It's tough. Yeah, I was just wondering, what do you favor more? Would you favor something that looks good or something that looks accurate with your work? Something that looks good or looks accurate? Yeah. Something looks good. <clears throat> I mean, I'm hoping that it's accurate too, but... Accurate usually looks good. <laughs> Yeah, I guess it would. I think I appreciate. Yeah, I, I mean that's a that's an interesting question. I it's, there's sometimes where I really uh, appreciate a good drawing. You know, maybe it. But then would I say, does it not look good though? But I appreciate the drawing. But it, yeah, I'm not sure. I think his answer. Looks good. <laughs> a few more questions from the chat. Uh -huh. um, how did you how did you find financial stability when you started out? I'm surviving from contract to contract. Did you face the same thing when you started out? Uh, I mean, I wasn't a contract artist to begin with. I was a studio artist. Worked at Interplay. The first job was a I worked at a T-shirt company. Like doing. Yeah, as an artist, but not doing much. But uh, that was really quick. So that's generally a good way to, for a student, you know, work at a company so that you can learn those skills on the job, you know, get production experience, that kind of thing. They're, they're real valuable. Uh, going freelance, I kind of, yeah, I shared my story, at least my story. It was, uh, wasn't easy going. Easier now, but there's still times. It, hey, where's all the work? <laughs> hey guys, I'm I'm available, you know, and I've got to hustle, and I've got to. Uh, so, a part of it you kind of know, you sort of start predicting a little bit how work's going to go, start planning a little bit better, uh, so that you always have something sort of going on. You're not totally high and dry. I think I learned that lesson early on. This one's for Justin. Your earlier paintings seem to have a very uh, classical feel slash approach. Were you looking at old masters, or was it something you specifically strived for? Yeah, I, I definitely uh, would say that I looked at a lot of the old masters. I looked at a lot of Rembrandt when I was younger. Still look at Rembrandt. Um, and. Uh, like I mentioned with uh, Sargent, I would consider him an old master, I guess. As far as the old masters, probably just Rembrandt. Probably the main dude. I looked at a lot. We have a couple more questions. Um, any advice for someone trying to learn how to paint portraits? Take it away, Justin. <laughs> um, I had to paint portraits. I, I don't have a lot of advice on that one. Because I don't, I'd like to do that more often, but I don't really do it. I think I make up the portraits. But uh, as far as like having somebody sit there or, or you know, I. Not something I do. 
Yeah, maybe looking at great portrait artists. I mean, I guess I think of that. We had a, both me and Justin were on this. There was a company called Whiz Kids, and we did all these pirate portraits. That was a good job for just looking at, like, uh, Velasquez and uh, Spanish portrait painters and, uh, you know, just... I think getting a, a good diet of that early on and coming up with our own characters but kind of inspired by those those old classic paintings was was really good yeah it's been a few jobs like that where you get on a job and you, you do it so much like Lion King or you do that thing so much that it's um it's just you got the, like the you got all those hours in of exercise <laughs> and you got a chance to get paid for it uh, and you were better for it yeah Got five more minutes. Another question is, how does it feel looking back at your older work now, specifically from Interplay? I, I just came across some things I did. Yeah, it wasn't that great. <laughs> <laughs> it had something in it, maybe a little bit of, there was some charm in it maybe. That was about it. <laughs> a little bit. But. I've always had a hard time looking at my own work. I, I don't have my own work hanging on my walls, you know. It's work I want to aspire to. I was wondering, um, have you had prolonged periods of like um, no work, like three months, six months? Um, not three months or six months. For me, I'm, I'm trying to think of the longest period of time. Uh, I think early on it was, you know, it was just hard because I didn't know anybody. I didn't, uh, those, those were tough, but yeah, it seemed to turn a corner at some point where you, the clients started recycling and, you know, we were working multiple things at the same time and trying to put that together, you know, getting familiar with certain art directors and, but trying to think the longest period of time, it's hard to remember. I think, I think for me, I've always had like side illustration jobs in the background. So when I'm not on a film, I, I work on those. So I haven't really had like, I mean, they've, in some ways, you can consider it no work because it means that I'm not going to get paid for that thing for three months. But uh, I don't think I've had a day in years where it was like not one thing I could be working on. It's always something. The film business, though, sometimes it's like that. It might, might be like a, I think I had a couple month gap once. So during that time, you would um, would you like study other artists or like try to improve their own? That would have been a, a smart thing to do, but I had to scramble and figure out ways to keep making money, keep doing jobs. So you know, as you, as you get older, you start to collect stuff and get families and all that stuff. You gotta figure out how to keep the machine going. So it's not like the time you have when you're younger to just explore for a month, learn stuff, and, you know. Are we all done? It's up to you. It's up to me. <laughs> what time is it right now? 10.01. Oh, 10.01? Mm -hmm. we're, we're done then, huh? Thank you all. Will this live stream be available for us to read again or
Thank you all for coming. Uh, yeah. Thank yeah. you. And thank you, uh, online people. Are they still streaming? Yeah, yeah, still streaming. All right. Thank you guys for joining us. We love to be crying, but now we must make you adieu.